Today, we're going to talk about Elon Musk. He did an interview with the BBC, and a guy named James Clayton was the interviewer. Greg, why don't you tell us about the videos we're going to watch? Yeah, I'll be a long, a little long-winded on this one, unusually. First, this guy's been diagnosed with Asperger's, which today is not called Asperger's, but is autism spectrum disorder in the DSM. So we'll make sure we clear that up up front. We may say Asperger's just because we forget. But there's an interesting thing. He did a really good Saturday Night Live episode. And you could see when he first started, he would do this steepling thing that I always tell you not to do. And as soon as he got to where he was comfortable, he'd move his hands. So we'll see some of that and figure out, is that an adapter? Is it something else? My favorite line on the Saturday Night Live piece is when people were giving him a hard time about offending people. He said, I reinvented an electric car and I'm sending humans to Mars. Did you expect me to be a chill dude? So sense of humor is there. His illustrators and movement are typically awkward. You know, Asperger's causes or autism causes people to repeat moves sometimes. And we'll see a little bit of that and causes them not to make hard eye contact very often. We're going to cover this from the beginning to the end. That's important because you see transitions in this interview. And that's the way we do all of our videos so you can see what's going on and changing. Now, I'll, I'll leave you with this. Why are we doing Elon Musk? We usually do criminals and politicians. Well, there's two comic book folks that are in movies that he could be one or the other of. Tony Stark, who is a benefactor to humans, or Lex Luthor. Lots of money, lots of technology. What does he do with it? We're going to look at his motivation as well as his body language and his behavior through this whole video. Okay, count, so. I mean, you, you mentioned outages there. There have been several. Yeah. And we, we've actually spoken to an engineer who works at Twitter, and they yeah. said that the plumbing is broken here and it's on fire and there could be problems at any minute. Do you, do you, do you accept that? I mean, there have been a few outages, but uh, not for very long. And it's currently working fine. So you don't, you don't, it doesn't keep you up at night that Twitter might go offline again? Uh, at this point, I think we've got a pretty good handle on, on what makes Twitter work. Um, and uh, we're, we're also doing it with uh, 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 two data centers instead of three. So we used to have three data centers. Uh, we shut down one of them. So we were uh, actually two thirds of the, roughly two thirds of the prior uh, compute capability. Uh, but we've made uh, so many improvements to the uh, core algorithm. In some cases, we improved the um, uh, core algorithm by 80%. So the actual CPU usage or computer usage is dramatically less. Um, so, uh, but the results speak for themselves. Uh, the system, despite being at all-time highs of, of usage, is fast. It's responsive. It's more responsive than it was before the, the, before the takeover. Uh, and we've also added uh, long-form tweets. We've added. Uh, you can now post videos up to two hours and soon videos of any length. Um, we, we're rolling out our subscriber programs so, so people can, uh, content creators can uh, actually make a living on, on Twitter by having some of their content behind a paywall. Um, and um, we open source the algorithm so there's transparency about uh, what tweets get shown, what, you know, what, what content gets shown versus not. Um, I think you, you say, like, what are you really going to trust? Are you going to trust uh, uh, some sort of black box algorithm from some other site, or are you going to trust the thing that you can actually see and understand? All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so we're going to see the beginning of a baseline. We always get told these people who are not neurotypical, you can't read. But we can, because what we're doing is reading a, a baseline for a person who isn't neurotypical. And so this Asperger's or the spectrum person is going to have his own kind of baseline. But so what? So does Chase, and so do I, and so do, does Mark. Every time we look at a neurotypical person, they're different. So I want you to hear that when we first start. Musk starts with his hands braced on his knees and he's putting pressure down. That I associate with an adapter and discomfort in the beginning. And he does something that I think is part of his being on the spectrum. And that's that quick little hair thing he does every now and then, a repetitive move. I don't think it's an adapter. I think it's just part of what he does because I've seen him do it many times. Um, I don't think that this guy who is our friend James Clayton, I think he's not necessarily truthful in a few cases on here when he says we talk to people who said this and the reason i say that is because watch him watch the way he starts to move and we'll, we'll look at his hands we'll look at him stammer and stutter and him change his cadence many times but in this first one now let's just start paying attention to how he talks when musk is talking about i think i have a handle on how this works you see a little bit of distaste in his mouth so I think he's been through something we can't tell, but he's showing some signs of distaste or displeasure at that, as you see his mouth and his purses, his lips. Um, 
you know, when he gets to the tech piece, I expect him to be very comfortable, but he isn't. He trails off and he uses uh, a different cadence. His sentence structure changes and when he's getting to two instead of three, talking about redundancy in tech centers. So I, I don't know, is that because he was it was uncomfortable for him, but he surely shows some discomfort when he's explaining the tech. Then the questioner gets anxious to say something. If you want to watch, if you don't know that he's anxious, he touches his face several times. He does one inhale breath just before he touches his nose the last time. And that's him preparing to talk. So he's anxious to say something. And then we see this thing that he's going to do repeatedly. And that's touch his abdomen. And as things heat up, he's going to touch his abdomen more. And we associate that hand going to our body to barriers. Maybe it's something else in him, but I think that's what we're seeing. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, typically we'll see when somebody's stressed out, in my experience, I don't think there is any peer-reviewed stuff on this, but that doesn't mean it's not real. So I would see hand to soft body tissue and soft body part areas like hand to throat or neck and hand to abdomen as meaning similar things. People do that during stress. But right away here, Elon makes a single shoulder shrug during his comment about people making a living off of their content. And we typically see, we describe this as someone lacking confidence in what they're talking about. This is most likely his viewpoint on maybe what a living is, a living, and not some deceptive statement about the app itself. The reporter or interviewer here is a mess. He's desperately exerting control over himself. And that's a lot of the stuff that you're seeing with his movements is self-control or self-regulation. And it's not even consciously listening to what Elon is saying, like at all. He's even nodding before a point comes out. He's itching and scratching. And these are common behaviors in somebody with excitement and stress alike. This is where the phrase, I'm itching to do X, came from, because we tend to do those behaviors. The rigidity and this constant movement of his arm is also signaling some discomfort. And you're going to see that again. Uh, and I want you to be able to spot it if you're watching this. And he's managing how he's being perceived, his posture, making sure that everything is kind of perfect. And the entire clip, this reporter is living in an area that I call behind the eyes. This level of kind of self-consciousness and anticipation is kind of overwhelming him and completely disconnecting him from any real connection here. And he also starts nodding all the time before Elon's even made a point. And I'm not, it's kind of like an SNL skit, Greg, like you were saying a, a second ago. And I'm not sure if this was a last minute thing where they had to borrow chairs from a cheap motel or not, but him having his phone out as a reference as it's just bizarre to me noticing that. Uh, Scott, what do you think? All right. Yeah. Speaking of cheap motels, I think that's where this uh, interviewer stayed the night before and got cheap soap because he's scratching everywhere you can scratch just about that you can do on on video i mean he's scratching his face he's scratching his stomach he's scratching his leg as we go through this there are all kinds of places this guy's scratching so play pay attention to that and i think quite often it, it might be his little adapters or signals to himself to say okay here i go i've got to do this or i'm waiting or or um maybe he's adapting with them i really can't tell because there's so many of them going on in there but they're the same ones every time especially this that's like you guys were talking about let's keep an eye on that that face and and his chest right there, where he's he's, he's uh, or his stomach where he's scratching on his stomach. I think this whole thing is really interesting because Elon pretty much is is illustrating and everything's really low. I think Mark will probably talk about that. They're really low and, and just above his knees. So for somebody who's got as much confidence as he does, I think that that's that's fairly important, you know. And I think it's almost like a wind up to to what's coming. I can't tell if he can tell what's coming or not, but. He he seems he seems like he's prepped for this. He seems really prepared for for what he ends up talking about, um, and he and he illustrates almost exclusively when he's talking about action or descriptive words. We quite often that's when we do it, but in this case, the only times he does it, pretty much when we go on, it changes a little bit. Is when he's describing something or using um, words that describe an action that talk about an action or doing something. I think that little arm stretch where he does, where he does or like that, I think that's more of a tick than anything else. Initially, I thought it was an adapter, but I think it's, it's, it's might be a little habit he's got. Uh, and, but I, but again, I think he was totally prepared for this thing. And when, when he says, I think we've got a pretty good handle on what makes Twitter work. This is where things get a little bit iffy for him because that right arm goes from being, being, um, 
relaxed and stuff, he goes to being braced. So he's getting ready to to give his, his answer about that, about what he thinks about Twitter. And I think we're seeing that internal dialogue go on there, go on in there, and he's guarding what he might really want to say. I don't think he's holding anything back, but I think he's thinking about all the all the problems he's had getting this thing up and running and learning it from where I'm sure they just left it sitting there and said, okay, there you go. You take care of that smart guy. And he did, you know, so that's, that's also kind of awesome. And when uh, Chase is talking about that single shoulder shrug, I think there are two, unless we're talking about the same one, um, that's when his his, um, right hand and arm go from being rested and relaxed and that bracing. That's when we see that little shoulder shrug as well. I think it's his, maybe it's his, his left that we're seeing do that i can't remember if it was the right or left you're talking about so i'm uh, i'm not sure that he that he's completely confident with the answer because i think he's got a lot of thinking going on so when he delivers i think we're seeing that uh a teeny bit of insecurity about the problems he was having with twitter when they first got it up and running those are probably he's probably revisiting those emotionally um as he gives that answer so i think that's what we're seeing the uh what would we might assume to be um, not doubt, but but not really being positive um, about what he's saying. Although I believe he's he's not lying or anything, he's being forthright. But I think he's just a little bit. I don't want to say insecure. I shouldn't say that because he's probably not an insecure guy. I wouldn't think, but a little bit unsure about himself at that point. Mark, what do you think? Yeah, so it's a good generalization. Uh, his limbs tend to be quite relaxed. You know, the arms are relaxed down in what I would call the grotesque plane below the belt line, you know, until he does brace or he gets passionate and his arms come up to, to the chest height. You'll see that in, in, in a few clips time. Um, it's quite a busy baseline. There's a lot going on. There's a lot going on with both of them. Watch out for that steepling. Watch out for when he moves from relaxed arms to bracing. There's also a very interesting bent thumb action that goes on quite a lot. I think that's about his thought process and not quite uh, and that, that stress and tension of the thought process going into his thumb, maybe his neurotype uh, as, as well. Uh, one last thing I'll just say about this is we go through it and we look at the debate that's going on. As a good rule, if you're going to a knife fight, you should really take a knife and you probably want quite a sharp one. And we're going to see somebody who has no tools at all showing up to this particular fight that evolves over time. So uh, watch out for that. We'll be talking about that as well. That's all I got on that one. All right. If you don't know who we are, we're the Behavior Panel. And I'm Scott Rouse. I'm a body language expert and analyst, and I train law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. I created the number one online body language course, bodylanguagetactics.com, with Greg Hartley. Mark? I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language, help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, gain credibility every time they communicate, including some of the leaders of the G7. Chase, Chase. Hey, I'm Chase Hughes. Did 20 years in the U.S. military, published a number one best-selling book on behavior profiling, influence, and persuasion. And I teach those things to everybody today. Just type my name in the app store to get training. Greg? Greg Hartley. I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance interrogation instructor. I've written 10 books on body language and behavior, put together the number one body language tactics course with Scott, and I spend most of my time in business. One of those tape replays. You know, head count, so... I mean, you, you mentioned now such as that. There have been several. Yeah. And we, we've actually spoken to an engineer who works at Twitter, and they yeah. said that the plumbing is broken here, and it's on fire, and there could be problems at any minute. Do you, do you, do you accept that? I mean, there have been a few outages, but uh, not for very long. And it's currently working fine. So you don't, you don't, it doesn't keep you up at night that Twitter might go offline again? Uh, at this point, I think we've got a pretty good handle on, on what makes Twitter work. Um, and uh, we're, we're also doing it with uh, 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 two data centers instead of three. So we used to have three data centers. Uh, we shut down one of them. So we were uh, actually two thirds of the, roughly two thirds of the prior uh, compute capability. Uh, but we've made uh, so many improvements to the uh, core algorithm. In some cases, we improved the um, uh, core algorithm by 80%, so the actual CPU usage or computer usage is dramatically less. Um, so, uh, but the results speak for themselves. Uh, the system, despite being at all-time highs of, of usage, is fast. It's responsive. It's more responsive than it was before the, the, before the takeover. Uh, and we've also added 
uh, long form tweets. We've added, uh, you can now post videos up to two hours and soon videos of any length. Um, we, we're rolling out our subscriber program so, so people can, uh, content creators can uh, actually make a living on, on Twitter by having some of their content behind a paywall. Um, and um, we open source the algorithm so there's transparency about uh, what tweets get shown, what, you know, what, what content gets shown versus not. Um, I think you, you say, like, what are you really going to trust? Are you going to trust uh, uh, some sort of black box algorithm from some other site, or are you going to trust the thing that you can actually see and understand? <laughs> so then you changed your mind again and decided to buy it. Did well, you do that? Did you do that? I kind of had to. You, right. Did you do that because you thought that a court would make you do that? Yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is the reason. Right. So you were still trying to get out of it, and then you just were advised by lawyers, look, I ha you're going to have we're to, gonna, we're, to buy this. Yes. Interesting. So you, did, <laughs> so, yeah. So you, so you didn't, you didn't actually want to purchase it, even when you said you were going. You well, not at that you, price. You were going to, really? No, I mean, like, like, let's say, like, I think the analogy is pretty, pretty close. Like, let's say, you know, it's, it's like you, the, there's a warehouse full of goods. Uh, they say the warehouse, uh, less than five percent of what's in the warehouse is broken. And then you look at, you, you walk into the warehouse, you say, actually, it's twenty-five percent. So you, you know, you might still want to buy what's the in that warehouse, but probably at a lower price not buying the stuff that's broken so you, that, you didn't have an epiphany you just thought i'm gonna i'm gonna have to buy this i might as well buy the bullet yeah so, <laughs> so then you walk it's in, not super complicated right right <laughs> i'm not sure you've said that before oh fair enough um so then you you came into Twitter. Q, 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 a whole bunch of court cases. <laughs> <laughs> you said this in the bbc interview blah, blah, et cetera. All right, Chase, what do you got? Elon's behavior in this clip is his baseline. And it's the same behavior you'll see on Joe Rogan. It's the same behavior you'll see when he's hanging out with somebody doing a different interview. He's commonly making these little adjustments with his shoulders in many cases. And this is usually social discomfort when you see it. Elon's already acknowledged publicly that he has Asperger's syndrome and some of the most common behaviors associated with that are difficulty in social settings and repetitive behaviors like you're seeing here in this clip. The reporter's genuinely trying to manage every movement of his body here to control his anxiety and his stress on camera. And this is something that people tend to go through as well when they start learning body language and nonverbal communication skills. I know I certainly did. And there's a tendency to overanalyze everything, including yourself, and then overmanage everything. And this quickly becomes exhausting. And I think most people find this transition point where they just finally let go and take off the handcuffs of kind of worrying about the perceptions of so many people. And people learning body language tend to think everyone else knows what they know. Truth is, 99% of people have nothing even resembling a clue about most of this stuff. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is really an interesting one. And Chase, I like that you bring up that this is his baseline. I think his baseline is fairly complex. I think like most folks who get this far in life, he has a, a baseline for when something is pitched to him and he has to respond. And by that, I mean a provocation versus something he has to think about. <clears throat> and that baseline is his, finger, his steepling sitting there waiting, and then he'll start to speak and use his hands and do all of that. I, he's, we're going to see later that when he is forced to think, he has a very different baseline and it's very consistent. So we're going to look for baselines when he's doing one thing versus doing the other. All humans do it. We all have different things. And that's how we create a strung together baseline for the entire person, not simply little snippets. So we're going to see a snippet here, a snippet there, and we'll string together what's normal. He, there's another interesting thing. When you are the 800 pound gorilla, when you are the alpha, other people emulate your behavior. Think of Trump and all the people doing this around Trump. There's something really weird about that. When you happen to be non neurotypical and you do odd things, you can even get to a point that other people are copying you because it's innate in us. The four of us have body language that's similar because we're part of a culture. And wherever the 800 pound, 800 pound gorilla is, folks are going to emulate his behavior. So it gets really odd when it's a non neurotypical. I'd love to watch meetings with this guy. <clears throat> We're going to see some, some unique body language as he goes through this. Here he's in, 
as he's starting to think, he's doing normal kind of what we would consider normal gesturing, illustrating as he's bringing up facts about business. He's lockstep in his cadence and his illustrators. Everything's aligned. We call that congruency. And you've seen this in other interviews in the past with him. But when he's uncomfortable, he'll jump up in a chair, do other things. And I think that's part of what we're seeing with that shoulder shrug. That's repetitive motion. I think it's related in this case to the autism rather than to the to the actual message he's trying to send because he's so free in his in his gesturing and his illustrating when he goes to no brainer watch his hands he does the same thing we all do that's a no brainer touch his side of his head and then starts to joke about cueing the court cases let's watch this interviewer <clears throat> now we know what his pitch tone and cadence are normally because he's pretty fluid here boom 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 he's illustrating in front of himself he's illustrating even with his finger he's illustrating and making his points Wait until he gets under stress and watch some of this change. This will be a really good example of what baseline looks like in one person or another and which one's feeling the most stress. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, so very specific and important. And it comes from this phrase of uh, in business of never be a forced seller. Well, Musk here is a forced buyer. He's being forced to buy this company uh, by the courts. And we see him brace himself go from relaxed to braced when he starts talking about having to buy Twitter, being forced by the courts, because, you know, just it's just a, an absurd situation to be in, uh, because it's the exact opposite of the forced uh, seller situation. It's the forced buyer situation. In a business sense, it's an absurdity. I think that's part, that's where the humor comes for him. We'll talk. We'll hear him later talk about the idea of absurdity. And absurdity and humor is a way more kind of European uh, idea, um, way more German, way more Dutch um, uh, uh, kind of style, um, and, and potentially more neurotypical for him, absurd humor. So I think that's uh, it is his baseline, but I think that's where he finds the humor, the the, the opposites in there. Um, there's a. I was watching uh, an episode of Ted Ted Lasso. It was, I think, the first episode of the second season. Uh, there's somebody says in that uh, he's not being rude; he's being Dutch. So understand different, and 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 um, uh, Musk comes from a Dutch Pennsylvanian background, uh, English background as well. Um, so uh, South African as well. Again, links with with the Dutch as well. So we're going to get uh, an English. Dutch absurdist kind of world from him, as well as his neurotype as well, enjoying that kind of scene as well. So I think that's why we get this succession of laughter um, from him. Now, he spins that into it's not super complicated. Uh, his opposition here, Clayton says, uh, but I'm not sure you've ever said that before. And uh, Musk concedes on that. Fair enough. So I think in debate sense, uh, I would say James Clayton actually kind of wins that little bit of that argument there by, by, um, by Musk conceding that he's never told anybody this before and therefore this is new information. Uh, I, I, and I think we see the enjoyment in Clayton of, of managing to score a point. So here's what we need to understand is that he is there to try and score points. He is there to try and have some kind of debate. So you'd hope that he's got some tools at the ready to continue this debate. Uh, let's see whether he has. Let's see how he gets on. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go a little bit against what you guys said about the, uh, the laughing and stuff. Because I think what happened there was when he was forced to buy it, I think when they got in there and found out it was quote unquote broken to that extent, I think he he probably knew that and he was going in and he got a better deal when they made him buy it than he would if he just waltzed in and bought it. So I think that's why he gets that little shits and giggles and that little that little goofy bump going on when when he talks about that and then he says, Yes, that's the reason. Because I think I think that's his leak. I think by accident he said, Yeah, that's the reason. Because I think he got a better deal on it. Because we're talking about billions of dollars here. I don't know what was he what what did he was he going to buy it for in the first place, and what did he end up buying it for? Do you guys know? Did he save any money? Was it cheaper? I think it was the fifty four was the initial offer. I think, and he paid forty three. I think, yeah. Okay, so so maybe that was it. So maybe he saved you know a few billion dollars 
by doing that. That's the way it looked to me. That's what I that's what I took from it. Um, and this and now we're seeing his illustrators. They're way up. They're they're way up here. This is where, where's the passion plane, Mark? This is the passion plane. Two right around the chest. Yeah. Okay. Then and this is the what plane? Closure or disclosure? Thought up here. Ecstatic up here. Okay. Well, then we only see that one time when both of his fingers come up. And they're almost eye level when he's when he's up in there. So I think he's he's fairly excited about this because I think he's. I don't think he knows how to how to control that that giddiness he's got about the the better deal that he that he got on that uh, at that point, um, and I think th- so. His confidence cues are when he sits up straight and he steeples his fingers, even though they're not steepled the way we'd like for you to. And then he laughs, and his voice volume is really really strong. So he's really confident that voice volume gets strong. However, we're going to see one where he's confident, where his voice volume is lower. It's still got a good tone to it, but the volume is fairly lower. But that's that's in a few videos from now. One of those tape replays. <laughs> <laughs> so then you changed your mind again and decided to buy it. Did well, you do that? Did you do that? I kind of had to. You, right. Did you do that because you thought that a court would make you do that? Yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is the reason. Right. So you were still trying to get out of it, and then you just were advised by lawyers, look, I ha- you're going to have to, we're gonna, we're, to buy this. Yes. Interesting. So you, <laughs> so, yeah. So you, so you didn't, you didn't actually want to purchase it, even when you said you were going. You well, not at that price. Going to, really? No, I mean, like, like, let's say, like, I think the analogy is pretty, pretty close. Like, let's say, you know, it's, it's like you, the, there's a warehouse full of goods. Uh, they say the warehouse uh, less than five percent of what's in the warehouse is broken. And then you look at you, you walk into the warehouse, you say actually it's twenty five percent. So you, you know, you might still want to buy what's the in that warehouse, but probably at a lower price. Not buying the stuff that's broken. So you, that... had, you didn't have an epiphany. You just thought, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to buy this. I might as well buy the bullet." Yeah. So, <laughs> so then you walk. It's not in... super complicated, right? Right. <laughs> I'm not sure you've said that before. Oh, fair enough. Um, so then you you came into Twitter. Q, a, Q, Q, a whole bunch of court cases. <laughs> <laughs> you said this in the BBC interview, blah, blah, etc. Um. Do you, do you have any regrets on the way that some of the staff were let go? Uh, I mean, people were given, you know, three months of severance, some cases more. So, um, but, you know, we're, we're, like I said, the companies need to be run on their own cognizance. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, not, it's not so easy for me to sell stock, as people might think. I have to sell stock during certain periods. I can't sell stock during other periods. Um, so there's only, there are only brief windows where I can sell Tesla stock. And then this is often taken as some lack of faith in Tesla. And in fact, the, the, the Tesla stock sales caused the Tesla stock to plummet, uh, which is not good. Do you think those two were connected? Well, the, 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 the people couldn't, couldn't parse the difference between I'm selling Tesla stock because I have, I've lost faith in Tesla, which I haven't, or that it's desperately needed for Twitter. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so for me, there's a strong baseline change here and in that his hands come up to his chest, up to his mouth here, up into passion, up into closure around the mouth as he starts to talk about the difference between selling uh, uh, Tesla stock because because you're uh, concerned about it and needing to sell it, being forced to sell it in order to fund Twitter. Again, I think a point is scored for uh, Musk on this in saying that, you know, people can't pass the difference between the two. So again, there's a there's a hit there on the intelligence of anybody who's saying the two things are linked. And again, I think that's why we get the the change in his nonverbal there. He wants to make it very, very clear that he understands how this business works at a, at a much higher level, more intricate level than most other people are thinking. So clear uh, difference there in in the baseline. I think it's pretty strong. Greg, what do you got? Greg? Greg yeah, and, and Mark, here's where I think this is part of his baseline. I think what we're seeing is a deviation, a change from response to provocation to internalizing and thoughtful answer with some concepts and some depth. And if, if you're arguing with this guy, there's something going on right here that you can figure out how he would argue. He throws out what's allowed in the argument. And as long as you don't fight back, 
That's how he's going to close the argument, because you can hear him giving you the list of reasons. This is really common, by the way, in CEOs, guys. If you're dealing with a CEO and they say, bam, 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 and you don't fight the facts before they get to the close, you're going to play hell with that guy at the end. So what he's doing is classic. I see it all the time when I'm dealing with people. But this is the first time we see this introspective baseline. Mark, I think it's a great deviation. What he does when he's answering anything for stream of thought, I think, is what we're seeing. His arms go across his torso, gives him space. His eyes drop. Now, we could say his eyes are dropping to emotional because this is related to compassion about laying people. We can't know that. We can know <clears throat> because he's not neurotypical and I... Eye contact is not typical for him. He breaks eye contact a lot. So it could be a comfortable place. Could also be compassion. He clearly knows that he has to be compassionate in what he says. He says, look, we gave him three months. <clears throat> These are pretty standard business answers. We see this all the time. I mean, look, when you're laying off people, it's always difficult. And they always have to have an answer for it. And his baseline here, I think we see plenty of of good stuff that says that his hands are back to that adapter and steeple when he gets comfortable, shoulders up in helplessness. And then he puts his thumb to his chin, all that stuff as he's navigating what to say. And then he brings up all the rationale. Companies should stand alone. I can't sell stock without consequences. His eyes drop down to the right. This shows understanding. And, and that's all I see. It could be emotion, could be something else. Uh, Scott, what do you got? All right. I think this is a great example of, of what he looks like when he's thinking while he's talking as he's structuring things because he's he's structuring for understanding let's keep in mind this is a rocket scientist talking to someone of average intelligence i would assume having watched this interview so i think he's structuring it to make it really plain but not just for that guy but for everyone watching because you know he can he can his normal conversation his vernacular is going to be way up there it's going to be easy he's a really smart guy so i think that that's what he's taking so much time doing as he goes through and all those little breaks when he's talking his voice is back to his baseline so it's much softer the volume is, is down a bit and he's talking slower and again very clearly because he wants to make sure what he's saying gets it gets across just the way he wants it across when we see that arm across his chest i don't think we're seeing barriering in the classic sense um I think I think that's just what he does when he's thinking because he does this a lot. When I'm thinking, I do this a lot too. Not that I'm like Elon Musk or smart like that guy, but for some reason, I always do that. And I've said on here a thousand times, I always do that. He does something similar to that, and a lot of people do something similar to that when they're thinking. So as he's thinking during the conversation, that's what we'll see, and he does it again a few times as, as well. And then he he has that uh, almost a confirmation nod when he's finished with a statement. Letting the letting the interviewer know that that's what he's going that he's finished or he's that's the statement he wants to make that's the completion of it. So I think when we see that we're going to see it done really big uh, a few times as we as we go on uh, as we go on. But understand it, or that's my take on on what we're seeing when he's nodding his head like that is like here it comes I'm finished. And usually people will say that when they say I didn't do it. And they're using it as an illustrator. I really don't think he's illustrating here. I think he's just confirming here like that with that nod chase what do you got yeah i, I agree with you all on everything and the, on top of all this uh greg to your point elon i think does a masterful job of redirecting here he redirects the question from how people were let go to him selling stock in a matter of seconds and the reporter here dives right into the new topic without hesitation and elon's exhibiting honest behavior in this clip his arm crossings more likely due to his feeling, uh, I think, it, potentially feeling insecure about his body than anything uh, that somebody initially assume is defensive or withholding. I don't think that's the case here. As he crosses his arm across his body, his foot goes out. And this is a reliable signal of confidence and comfort. And the reporter is still more insecure in this clip. There's one question that I came up with. It's a screening tool that I thought of after having too much wine one night with Mark Bowden. And as you're looking at people who are seated, almost any situation, look them over and ask one filter question first to determine who's more comfortable in the situation and who's not. And here's the one question. Which human being would have a more difficult time standing up and running away? And the person who's least physically prepared to get up from their seat is the most comfortable in that situation. And, but, uh, how did I do? All right. Perfect. All right. So the reporter here is ready to leap upward from his seat 
throughout this entire thing. His legs are like springboarded underneath, tucked under the seat, but still ready to stand if he needs to. So keep an eye on that as we move forward. One of those tape replays. Um, do, you, do you have any regrets on the way that some of the staff were let go? Uh, I mean, people were given, you know, three months of severance, some cases more. So, um, but, you know, we're, we're, like I said, the companies need to be run on their own cognizance. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, not, it's not so easy for me to sell stock, as people might think. I have to sell stock during certain periods. I can't sell stock during other periods. Um, so there's only, there are only brief windows where I can sell Tesla stock. And then this is often taken as some lack of faith in Tesla. And in fact, the, the, the Tesla stock sales caused the Tesla stock to plummet, uh, which is not good. Do you think those two were connected? Well, the, 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 the people couldn't, couldn't parse the difference between I'm selling Tesla stock because I have, I've lost faith in Tesla, which I haven't, or that it's desperately needed for Twitter. Um, okay, and then after that, after um, you um, let go of a lot of stuff, obviously Twitter became slimmed down a lot, and then you started making some more policy decisions. One of those policy decisions was to bring Donald Trump back. He hasn't actually tweeted yet. Right. Do you expect him to come back at any point? Like, have you have you spoken to him? I haven't spoke to him. Uh, I don't know. He may or may not come back. Uh, the, but the, but the point is that uh, Twitter should be uh, a town square that or, that is uh, gives uh, equal voice to. You know the the whole country and ideally the whole world. Um, it should not be a partisan politics. Uh, you know, and and the more of a partisan politics that are on the very far left of the spectrum. San Francisco Berkeley, Berkeley politics normally is quite niche, um, but if, if Twitter effectively acted as a megaphone for a very niche regional politics and and megaphone that to the world. So, if in order for something to serve as a digital town square, it must. Uh, you know, so all people from all political persuasions, uh, provided it's legal. Um, so, you know, close to half the country uh, voted for Trump. Uh, I wasn't one of them. I voted for Biden. Um, but nonetheless, uh, you know, free speech is meaningless unless you allow people uh, you don't like to say things you don't like. Otherwise, it's irrelevant. Um, and if at the point at which you lose uh, free speech, uh, it doesn't come back. Okay, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is a, a good one for us to start seeing the interviewer feeling less than comfortable. He starts off, though, doing what he normally has been doing. He's still illustrating in frame. He's pointing to illustrate. And when we say illustrators, it's punctuating words, thoughts, phrases, whatever. I always say punctuating your thoughts. He's got a longer sentence structure, and he's thinking a hard question. But he's already starting to barrier a little bit with this phone. As he gets to a more contentious question, he'll raise that phone. <clears throat> Wait until he gets called on the carpet and watch what he does with the phone. And hang in there. He's going to. Um, as you watch Musk, he's when he's bringing up these points about free speech and that, he's steepling, but he opens his hands and thumbs up in confidence as he answers all the importance of, of free speech. He doesn't use, use his brow very much. Musk is not high brow use. And what we've seen a lot of times with people on the spectrum is they don't engage their brow a lot. But he, when he talks about the whole country and the whole world, there's passion and there's that request for approval with his brow. And that's not because I'm lying. That's because I need you to understand what I'm saying. He also does facial illustrating when he does nonetheless. I don't know what I'd even call that. He draws the sides of his mouth back and does an odd kind of face. But we're starting now to see what makes him him. And we're seeing a very unique to him, illustrator that people around him probably adopt. Where Trump does this with the finer point, he's doing it on the top of his leg, which is just him doing the same thing. He's making his point. Um, and it doesn't come back downward. It, it doesn't come back when he's talking about the freedom of speech. If you lose it, he's got a downward tone and he's telling and he leans in clearly to send his message. As he's doing every one of these things, He's asking, do you understand the elements? You'll listen to his voice lilt a little because the elements of what he's doing, go back to that last video, he's starting to say these are admissible elements of the argument. And he's one of those kind of people that the last thing you want to do is try to turn and change directions on him and once you've agreed to those things because he's going to chase you and he's going to run you down. When, when my son was around, he used to tell people that come to my house, it's okay to run out of points and facts to defend yourself. 
Just don't turn and run because it will get ugly if you turn and run. And that's a very much a business approach. When you run out of facts, you say, I don't know anymore. That's all I got. And when you've got a guy who has been this successful in business, forget whatever rocket science or whatever other thing he's doing, Scott. This guy is a master of business of what he's done and how what he's accomplished more than anything else. That's why he's a Tony Stark and Lex Luthor thing. He's got more money than anybody. On, well, now he doesn't. He spend more of it. But he had more money than anybody on earth and was at the top for a long time. He's more of a business guy, I, I think, than a techie guy. He just knows the right techie guys to bring in. Just my opinion. And he's using a lot of that business acumen to get things done. Scott, what do you got? All right. I think this is a serious and prepared delivery because he's talking about what he thinks Twitter is and what it should be from a, as a whole, you know, from in my heart, this is what I think Twitter is because he spent billions buying this thing. So it has to mean something to him. So I think that's why you, that the, the, the words he is vernacular while you, while explaining that's different than everything else we've heard. It's very clean. It's really, it's things you've heard before. It's almost like those, it's not quite like a, a, a pitch, like a purpose statement, but it, it hints at that. So I think he was trying not to say the purpose statement as he was saying, why it was important. That's why I think that sounds so prepared at the beginning there. And then again, he starts steepling his hands and he's using that classic Elon Musk voice. Um, and the tones is back to his baseline. His eye contact again is is strong compared to what we've seen so far. It's been kind of loose up to this point, but now he's as he's telling what he thinks about Twitter. That's when we see it get strong because he he's just delivering something that that he's already had uh, prepared up there and ready to go. Uh, the interviewer has a pretty good clean uh, tone and everything at this point. And one thing that I noticed about it was starting to bug me to death is. He's all the time looking up and to the left before he starts talking. Then he'll look over here or when he finishes talking and looks over here, it's just, it's getting on my last nerve. It's probably just some kind of a, a little tick he has that he has to do. Maybe he's thinking and he looks up that way, but it seems he's always looking up here before he says something, but that could be his, his stop, you know, hang on a second. Cause I want to say something, you know, getting to that mode and say something heavy or I'm, I'm, it's my turn and I need to think a second. I need you to see me looking away so you won't say anything. Like sort of like an um that people do that Elon Musk does um, not quite a bit, but he does that a few times in here. Um, then he starts scratching his face as that adapter again, and I think I think that just must be part of his little nervous baseline uh, because we see it so often. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I think Clayton tries to give an attack with the association with Trump and uh, giving him back or freeing his account. Um, Musk come back, comes back with, I haven't spoken to him. He may or may not come back. And we see a very subtle but pronounced postural bump in, uh, in Musk. I think he is, I don't think that's a positivity or optimism around Trump at all. I think it's a positivity that he just scored a point with him because he said, look, I, I can open up the gates to Trump, but I can't open up whether he tweets or doesn't tweet and he hasn't tweeted. So, you know, it's a, it's a point for him in terms of free speech and lets him into his town square message, which I think you're right, uh, Scott, it's a prepared message. It's what he's come to deliver. I think it's clear from uh, from his symmetrical gestures that start happening at that point and at exactly naval level, truth plane there, that this is the message he's come to, or the first message that he's he's come to, to give. Um, he gives it really well, I think. Uh, we get uh, the BBC uh, Clayton adapting again on his on his shirt. Um, so it really, really hasn't gone his way. So scores at this point, I'm saying it's it's three one to to Musk. I, I think I think Clayton's got one in, but Musk is is way ahead uh, in the game now, and and let's see how it progresses. Uh, Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, y'all covered y'all covered a lot of what I had here, but. Yeah, th this is probably something I'm going to have to come up with a name for. This reporter's just nodding his way through Elon's answer to his questions and just waiting for his turn to talk. Just I waiting. That's what the name of it is. Waiting for his turn to talk. Yeah. There's no listening going on at all. And maybe we could just call it fake listening. And I think you could have stopped this, this guy mid answer while Musk was talking and asked the reporter, what, what did Elon say? just now 
<laughs> I don't think he would know. And what Elon's referencing, or when he's e referencing these Berkeley politics, there's an interesting eye accessing movement. And eye accessing is when we move our eyes around in, in our head to access information uh, and is going down into his right, which corresponds at about 100% rate, give or take, to emotional processing. So when somebody looks down into the right, that's what's going on. And as an interesting side note, if you drive a Tesla, you're looking down and right to access all the information about your vehicle all the time. And that's where the designers place the information in the screen in the car. And if you have been studying behavior, you've taken a course or two of mine, you'll know why this might be a deliberate effort to place the screen there on a Tesla. One of those tape replays. Um. Okay, and then after that, after um, you um, let go of a lot of stuff, obviously Twitter became slimmed down a lot, and then you started making some more policy decisions. One of those policy decisions was to bring Donald Trump back. He hasn't actually tweeted yet. Right. Uh, do you expect him to come back at any point? Like, have you have you spoken to him? I haven't spoken to him. Uh, I don't know. He may or may not come back. Uh, the, but the, but the point is that uh, Twitter should be uh, a town square that or, that is uh, gives. Uh, equal voice to you know the, the whole country and ideally the whole world um, it should not be a partisan politics uh, you know and and the more of a partisan politics that are on the very far left of the spectrum San Francisco Berkeley politics normally is quite niche um, but if, if Twitter effectively acted as a megaphone for a very niche regional politics and at, and megaphone that to the world so if in order for something to serve as a digital town square, it must, uh, you know, serve all people from all political persuasions, uh, provided it's legal. Um, so, you know, cl close to half the country uh, voted for Trump. Uh, I wasn't one of them. I voted for Biden. Um, but nonetheless, uh, you know, free speech is meaningless unless you allow people uh, you don't like to say things you don't like. Otherwise, it's irrelevant. Um, and if at the point at which you lose uh, free speech, uh, it doesn't come back. I, th I think the issue some people have is that a lot of people were brought back. I mean, some people were brought back who uh, were previously banned for spreading things like uh, QAnon conspiracies. You have people like Andrew Tate who were brought back who were previously uh, banned for things like hate speech. Do you think you prioritize freedom of, of speech over misinformation? And hate speech. Well, you know, who's to say that something something is misinformation? Um, who's the arbiter of that? Is it the BBC? And you, you literally, literally asking me? Yes. Well, no. You, you, are, the, the you are the arbiter on Twitter because you own Twitter. Yes, I'm saying who who is to say that uh, one person's misinformation is another person's information? Um, at the point at which you you say that. There is, uh, this is misinformation. Like, who is but going you, but you to decide that? you accept that misinformation that? can be dangerous, that it can cause yes. real world harms, that it can potentially cause them. Um, yeah, so the point I'm trying to make is that the BBC itself has, at times, published things that are false. Do you agree that that has occurred? I, 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 I'm quite sure the BBC have uh, said things before that turn out to not be true. Right. Uh, in, in its, whatever it is, 100 year history, I'm quite sure. Yes. Even if you aspire to be accurate, there are times when it will, you, you will not be. Right, but I, think, that, I think in the but, grand scheme of things, accept, the BBC does, does aspire to be accurate. But you accept there has to be a line in terms of hate speech. I mean, not, you're not looking at total, 100% unrestricted speech. Um, there's, well, I mean, I generally am of the opinion that if, if, uh, if, you, if, if the people of a given country are against a certain type of speech, they should talk to their elected representatives and pass a law to prevent it. So, for example, you, you cannot advocate murdering someone. That's illegal in the United States. Everywhere, really, I, I suspect. Um, so, uh, so there are limits to speech. Um, All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so this is great. We get a lot of wobblehead action from Clayton here, as uh, as as Musk comes in with with an idea that, of course, you know, the BBC within their history must have got things wrong. Um, of course, it's a hard one. It's a hard one not to concede to, and Clayton wasn't expecting it. And you see him 
<clears throat> almost kind of knocked uh, senseless uh, by this one. We, we, we get the adaption again to the shirt. The hand comes in to the shirt again, nervous about that. Uh, but he wants to fight back. So we see the hand go go down and turn in and place on his knee so his elbow will be out. Very uncomfortable position to put yourself in, to turn your hand in to support yourself. And it's simply because he's going to be able to do the I'm bigger than you thought I was gesture and increase the size of him. So Clayton is is very much on for a, a bit of a fight uh, here. Um, but in, in, in debate terms, I think that Musk is a little bit smarter because he invokes democratic lawmaking. Basically goes, do you think, do you think governments should make laws, uh, should be in charge of making the laws? Well, that, that's a hard one uh, not to concede to as well. Um, so Clayton's getting upset for sure, trying to make himself look bigger. I think, I think Musk is getting a little bit more energized now as well. You see his fingers spread out. You see, you see some, uh, some digital flexion, as Chase would say, on his other hand. Uh, there we see him move position as well before he invokes the democratic idea. Uh, it, it's another win for Musk, I would say. We're at 5-1. Now it's going to be hard for Clayton to pull back out of this one. Uh, Scott, what do you got? All right. This is where everything changes, like big time, because Elon gets really still and his voice lowers. His, and his eyes widen up a little bit and his nostrils flare a little bit. And he's answering that second question. His volume comes up some, just a little bit, not a whole lot. He's got that steepling, but it goes away. And then when he's asking, when he says, do you believe that has occurred? He has those big nods and he has that long pause right there because he's putting that guy on notice that it, you, you stepped in here, man, because he was ready for this. You know, how couldn't he be at this point? So, and then he's and he's turning the interview around on this guy, on that interviewer, and he should never have let him do that. He shouldn't put himself in that spot. And I don't think he's got. Enough, he may be the most experienced interview in the world. I don't know, but I don't think an experienced interviewer would let it get to that. I don't think Gail King would let that happen. So I, I think getting him cornered like that, man. Since we box people in when we're talking to them in a conversation to try to get them to tell them something, tell us something uh, that they did, they don't want to talk about it, didn't want to do. That's what I'm seeing there. He didn't. He, I don't know if he if he had a tactic to go about doing that because I'm really not seeing seeing the way he went about doing that from our perspective as far as interrogation goes. But man, he got him right. In the, if he was in the box, he got him cornered good right there, and he couldn't get out of it. So. Um, and then he goes back into his thinking and talking mode again. He gets that arm up, and and and, and you see him thinking as he's talking and structuring, and he delivers that again while he's illustrating with the, with the one hand. And I think he's still thinking at that point because I think he gets quiet because he's trying to hold back that that initial energy or that initial pump of of adrenaline when he's like, "Oh, I got him now, and I'm going in." So I think that's why he quiets down, sort of to to stay calm. Chase, what do you got? This was a great one to watch today. Um, when Elon hears the topic of the question, just the topic comes up, you can see him do several things that go back to that single question from earlier. How ready is this person to stand up from where they're at in the seated position? His foot pulls back, making his feet into a perfect position to stand and kind of step forward. His posture becomes erect and upright. His breathing rate increases, and it does so into his chest. And the chest breathing is more stressful than abdominal breathing. If someone's completely and fully relaxed, you'll see the abdomen, uh, the abdomen rising and falling instead of the chest. And the reporter here seems to have questions that he thinks are more important than any dialogue at all. And there's less fake listening here, but only slightly less that Elon goes through a series of stress and comfort in this one clip that you can see when it plays back. And what's going to be interesting when you watch this clip again is seeing the moments that this stress appears and his comfort starts to return. And I think that's really telling. That's all I got. And Greg, 
What do you got? (laughs) Hey, so when we talk about interrogation, we talk about talking to the person you want to bring to the show, the person you want to get started talking. So, for example, if I were going to talk to Oprah Winfrey, I wouldn't talk to the mogul. I would talk to the poor kid who grew up in Mississippi. And you try to find ways to talk to that. What he is, what this questioner, Mr. Clayton, has not done well is to identify something we're talking about clearly here. There are two stances that Elon Musk has, responsive and contemplating. And you don't want him in contemplating. We've seen that. He's going to read you the riot act, give you some elements of the argument, and then close it. But this guy doesn't see that. He can't see it. He's too busy, Chase, to your point, going to the next question and thinking he's scored one point to pay attention. Or he would have known that he was about to get into a bind right here and step in a bear trap. He starts off, meaning the reporter starts off on attack. Look at his fingers Mm. and his thumbs. They're, They're out now. They're not closed. We usually associate that with confidence. He's in a down tone as he's taking this these attacks. He's got a rhythmic cadence. We'll see that change in a video or two, and we'll see him hardly able to finish a sentence. There's arrogance as his chin thrust and he touches his abdomen. Then we see Musk get comfortable, and that's when everything changes. That rapid adapter to his hairline is likely just associated with the autism, but it may be an indicator something's about to change. It may be related to how his brain works. Don't know. But when he does that, we see something change. And the minute he turns back on and he starts to go after him and he contemplates and he starts taking this guy's argument apart and starts taking his story apart, you see the guy go right back to his abdomen with that hand as a barrier. And this is really clear that when he goes to this point and he starts to touch his chin, he's in a different mode. He is thinking about how to dismantle your argument. He's thinking about how to win that contest. And he doesn't have to be a classic great debater. As long as he gives you facts, you agree with those facts, and then at the end, there's nothing left. That's great negotiation. You don't have to be a great debater to be a great negotiator. And then he returns to that steeple. It's powerful. You can see it. And if this guy could see it, he probably would not get in the bear trap he's about to get into. One of those tape replays. I I think the issue some people have is that a lot of people were brought back. I mean, some people were brought back who uh, were previously banned for spreading things like uh, queuing on conspiracies. You have people like Andrew Tate who were brought back, who were previously uh, banned for things like hate speech. Do you think you prioritize freedom of, of speech over misinformation and hate speech? Well, you know, who's to say that something, something is misinformation? Um, who's the arbiter of that? Is it the BBC? And you, you're literally, literally asking me. Yes. Well, no, you, you, are, the, the you are the arbiter on Twitter because you own Twitter. Yes, I'm saying who, who is to say that one person's misinformation is another person's information? Um, the point at which you, you say that there is, uh, this is misinformation. Like, who is but going you, but you to decide that? you accept that misinformation can be dangerous, that it can cause yes. real world harms, that it can potentially cause. Um, yeah, so the point I'm trying to make is that the BBC itself has, at times, published things that are false. Do you agree that that has occurred? I, 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 I'm quite sure the BBC have uh, said things before that turn out to not be true. Right. Uh, it, it's whatever it is, 100 year history, I'm quite yes. sure. Even if you aspire to be accurate, there are times when it will, you, you will not be. Right, but I, think, that, I think in the but, grand scheme of things, accept, the BBC does, does aspire to be accurate. But you accept there has to be a line in terms of hate speech. I mean, not, you're not looking at total 100% unrestricted speech. Um, there's. Well, I mean, I generally of, I'm of the opinion that if if uh, if you, if if the people of a given country are against a certain type of speech, they should talk to their elected representatives and pass a law to prevent it. So, for example, you you cannot advocate murdering someone. That's illegal in the United States, everywhere, really. I, I suspect. Um, so, uh, so there are limits to speech. Um, I mean, yeah. I would only just add that, you know, we have spoken to people who, who have been sacked that used to be in content moderation. And, and we've spoken to people very recently who were involved in moderation. And they just say they just, there's not enough people to police this stuff, particularly around, um, particularly around hate speech um, in the company. Do, is that well, what hate that speech are you talking about? I mean, you use Twitter. Right. Do you see a rise in hate speech? 
I mean, I, I, but just a personal anecdote. Like, what do you do? I don't. P personally, my uh, for you, I would see I get I get more of that kind of content. Yeah, personally, but I, I'm not going to talk to talk to the rest of for, for the rest of Twitter. So you see more hate speech personally. I would say I would see more hateful content in that in that content probably. you don't like or or hateful. What do you mean to describe a hateful thing? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, just content that will solicit. A reaction, something that may include something that is slightly racist or slightly sexist. Those kinds of those kinds of things. So you think if I'm, something is slightly sexist, it should be banned? I, no, is that I'm what not, you're saying? I'm not saying anything. I'm saying. Well, I'm just curious. What you, I'm, I'm trying to understand what you mean by hateful con content. And I'm asking for specific examples. Um, and if and you just said that if something is slightly sexist, that's hateful content. Does that mean that it should be banned? Well, you've asked me. You've asked me whether my feed, whether it's got less or more. It, I'd say it's got slightly more. That's what I'm asking for examples. Can, right. you, can you name one example? I, I honestly don't. You, I, I, honestly, you I don't. You can't name I, a single example. I'll tell you why. Because I don't actually use that for you feed anymore. Because I, I just don't particularly like it. But you and said actually, a lot of people. A lot of people are quite similar. I, I, I only. Well, well, I only look well, at hang my, on a second. My you said you've seen more hateful content, but you can't name a single example. Not even one. I'm not sure I've used that feed for the last three or four weeks. And I. Well, then how did you see the hateful content? content? Because I've been I've been using I've been using Twitter since you've taken it over for the last six months. Okay, so then you must have at some point seen that you for you hateful content. And I'm asking for one example. Right, and, and you I, can't I, give us a single one. And, and, and I'm saying, I, I, then I, I say so that you don't know what you're talking about. Really? Yes, because you can't give me a single example of hateful con a content, not even one tweet, and yet you claimed that the hateful content was high. Well, that's a false. No, what I claimed, you just lied. What no no what I claim was. Uh, there are many uh, organizations that say that that kind of information is on the rise. Now, whether whether it has on Give my feed or example. not, I mean, I, right? And you can, can you name something one. like the, the uh, Strategic Dialogue uh, Institute in the, U in the UK. They will say that. So you, they, look, it's, people will say all sorts of nonsense. I'm literally asking for a right. single example, and you can't name one. Right. And as, as I've already said, I don't use that feed. But let's, well, then how let, would you know let, that? I don't you, think this is getting anywhere. You literally said you experienced more hateful content. And then couldn't name a single example. Right, and as I said, I that's absurd. I haven't, I haven't actually looked at that feed. I then how would you know this hateful content? Because I'm saying that's what I saw a few weeks ago. I can't give you an exact example. Let's move on. We have, we only have a certain amount of time. Um, wow. COVID misinformation. Uh, Chase, what do you got? As the clip starts out here, Elon is clasping his knees or resting his hands on his knees right there, and th I think this is him getting ready for these difficult questions here. Uh, and I'm saying this because he doesn't know the question yet. And th these are some stress signals, but he's also getting ready for action. And they're mixed with confidence. So his breathing rate goes down, which is how often we're breathing. It slows down as we get more confident, more comfortable, more relaxed. And he knows what's going to happen with this little reporter guy. And this is the equivalent of a chess game where only one player can see what the other is going to do in the next 15 moves, and the other player has no idea. So Elon knows exactly where this is headed based on this reporter's questioning and behavior. The reporter has no clue what is in store for him. So you can see Elon's posture, posture gradually build throughout the clip here, and he's gaining more confidence, and his blink rate has dropped down significantly which is how often we blink. We blink more often when we're stressed and less often when we're focused. The reporter's trying to backpedal out of being responsible for every word out of his mouth. He wants to be no longer responsible for everything that he says. And in interrogation training, this is called backstopping. This is when you elicit information and then use it without providing an exit for that person. You don't allow them to build themselves an exit out of the conversation. And I love how his questions are all about misinformation. At the same time, he's creating misinformation and, and deception here. So Elon's breathing rate spikes in the middle of this, right at the middle, as the social tension between these two increases. And he's having to keep this guy accurate. And the real struggle that Elon's having is getting integrity out of this person, which I think Elon's doing a pretty good job at here. And this is masterful, the way that he has kind of flipped this around uh, on this dude. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, here's the problem. 
uh, for the BBC is with a good debater, Musk would be in massive problems right now. Musk isn't that good at what he's doing, but he's so much better than the guy from the BBC. That's that's the issue. Musk's uh, tactic in the previous video was, I am, but what are you? Or it, whatever's good for the goose is good for the gander, which is not a brilliant tactic. The tactic he's about to use here is to is to ask for an example. Well, you've got to know that the person doesn't have an example. Either you know they haven't, they don't have an example, or you're a massive risk taker. Because if the person has an example, you're in massive problems. And it would leave him two avenues to go, um, to go, okay, well, yeah, that's a fair example. And, and we should have done something. We should do something about that. Or he'd have to go, that is not indicative of Twitter as a whole. There'd be, there's a few more avenues, but those would be the basic ones. Here's what a, a Maitland would have done. Maitland would have started it by going, uh, Mr. Musk, we have spoken to a number of your employees who all say, and would have shown something so that there, it looked like th there was a good, strong possibility that they had actually interviewed people. And, and what Maitland would do is actually have done the interviews and actually have the evidence. So go to a knife fight with a very sharp knife. We, we see from, from Clayton right at the start, he is unsure. And I think Musk jumps on that, knows that he's unsure and starts to dismantle the argument. Um, he uses the argument of, of uh, Clayton uses the argument of what we call the argument of ignorance, which is to basically go, well, everybody knows. Everybody knows Twitter is a, is a terrible place. That's, that's, it comes from the Latin ignorance, which means uh, as one would expect. As one would expect, this is how Twitter is. Well, uh, Musk goes, well, give me a, a solid example of that. And, that. and that's called burden of proof. OK, so give me the, you, the burden of proof is, is yours. So now give me that. Um, uh, he, I mean, here's the unfortunate thing. Clayton then has to, has to say the words, I don't like it, which is taste rather than ethics. So he gets pushed, gets pushed, not by great skill, but by some simple dismantlement because the person doesn't have actual evidence. We, we see him fall apart. He goes, I mean, kind of, yeah, uh, I mean, you know, uh, may include slightly. I'm not saying anything. I haven't. So everything is is moving towards the negative for Clayton. Not even one says uh, says Musk browbeating him at the same time. At that point, Musk knows that he's completely dismantled the argument. But, but not in a particularly brilliant way. You know, I'm sure he's great at putting rockets up in the air uh, and all kinds of other things. At debate, he's not spectacular, but he's more than good enough against this person from the BBC. Don't know what that guy's doing there. Complete disaster. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, Mark, I don't think he's debating. I think he's negotiating. And in negotiation, there's a concept, and I've made, there are tons of negotiation companies, so I don't want to give credit to one that's probably wrong. But one of them calls it throwing junk on my lawn. And that's what this guy is doing. That means there's no content. He's just throwing things out and seeing if they stick. <clears throat> we don't have to be a great debater. All you have to do is say, that's junk on my lawn. I'm not going to I'm not going to buy it. And that's what he does. He just puts him on notice. There's nothing there. Chase, you say, Chess, I think one of these – the board is common, but one of these guys is playing chess and the other is playing checkers is the problem. This guy thinks he understands the rules because the blocks are red and, and black. But this is a guy who negotiates for a living, guaranteed. You don't get this rich. You don't make this kind of money in business without being able to smell out something that's weak. The, this guy starts off again to attack with hands exposed and fingers and thumbs extended but he's illustrating out of frame when he's talking about this for the first time. And when I say illustrating out of frame, I don't mean big, Mark, like you talk about with passion. <clears throat> I mean out of frame where it's outside of his vision. I don't trust if a person tells me a fish is this big. OK, good. If it's that big. No. So I rarely trust when I see a person do that. And then you see him drop his hand for the first time. It literally drops to his thigh and slaps his leg. The words are emphatic, but the body language isn't. That makes me not trust that he's talked to anyone, to your point Maitland would have. His tone changes when he gets to the words hate speech. Musk is sitting there with intake face. He's braced. He's listening. Then his chin up as he pokes out. That's defiance or indignance. <clears throat> Indignation is he starts asking about his 
experience. And then you see full blown all of Musk's illustrators and everything start to have congruency. You see that Trump like illustrator, again, a confident thing that he used earlier. And then as Musk starts to attack this guy, this is I'm just going to run down a list of things I see happen in this guy. He changes cadence. He does that barrier at the abdomen. He does a nervous smile. His fingers are no longer spread. It's the first time we hear vocal fry. He qualifies. He contradicts himself in 20 words from one thing to another to say, I haven't, but other people have. He conditions the hell out of everything he's talking about. He's got an argument that's absolute fallacy. Other people, well, if you don't have any experience, then you're wasting your time. And we see him start to turtle. He goes from I to we, which we call pronoun shifting or blame sharing. And then he tries that t- to use the time we're running out of time and the agenda to get out of the situation. He can't finish an entire thought. And then you look and you say, one of the things that's interesting here is what you're seeing is a lack of social anxiety on Musk's part. And I think part of that's because like he said, I offend people all the time because I just am not keenly aware. But the other part is this kid has, I mean, this guy's been around this since he's a kid. He's been around situations where he's taken abuse. He's been treated badly. If you go read what he said, they say his life was excruciating as a child is the word I read. And this is back to that thing. When you run out of facts, say, I don't know, because when he attacks this guy, I love Mark, you're pointing out how he does and he goes and he's attacking him with body language, but he also does shoulders up at, you can't even give me one. That's, that's it. This guy's just nailed down. Scott, what do you got? Man, this is one of the reasons I hate going last because everybody's gotten everything. But I'll, I'll sort of, here's what I think. I think we're seeing a problem solver solve a problem because this guy's coming to him with a problem. And this is somebody, like I said earlier, it's this guy builds rockets and sends people to space. And he's not kidding around. He's doing that. This is the guy that, that, that made the electric car. They're everywhere now. It was a great idea. Everybody wants to do it and all that. But he said, okay, why don't we do that? And did it. A lot of problems come with that. With both of those things, with with changing the way people are are transported around their country and around the planet, literally around the planet with, with rockets. So he's used to dealing with problems. And he sees this guy or this situation as a problem. That's why he goes through and says, okay, well, what? how do we fix this problem? Tell me what the problems are. What are the problems you've had? Where did you? Where did these things happen for you? And I think he probably does this with people who are building those rockets for him and building those cars for him. He has the same style, the same style of conversation with him as he's breaking down the uh, information to get to the root of the problem and the things that that cause problems for him. So I think that's what we're seeing. I, not as much as I see where you're saying it's a, it's a negotiation skill as well, because boy, is a smoking negotiation skill he's got there. But this is a a, a, pro, a problem solving situation, I think, is as from my point of view. And you're right, Greg. That thing that that Trump thing where Trump does the he does a little pointing thing, and you pinpoint. That's when he pinpoints something important. And Musk does that here too, and he's pinpointing something, but it, he's bringing it toward himself. So it's that yeah. introspective thing. He's trying to solve this problem. That's why I think that's what I think is happening here. I think we're seeing a master problem solver solve a problem, and it just goes sideways for this guy. And he can't get out of it, and it just it just wow, it's so so bad for this guy. I don't feel sorry for him. He's asking for it, and they shouldn't have sent him in there because you you don't send a a mouse to do a, a rat's job, and that's what they've done. One of those tape replays. I mean, yeah. I would only just add that, you know, we have spoken to people who, who have been sacked that used to be in content moderation. And, and we've spoken to people very recently who were involved in moderation. And they just say they just there's not enough people to police this stuff, particularly around um, particularly around hate speech um, in the company. Do, is that well, what hate that speech are you address? talking about? I mean, you use Twitter. Right. Do you see a rise in hate speech? I mean, I, I, just a personal anecdote. Like, what do you do? I don't. P- personally, my uh, for you, I would see I get I get more of that kind of content. Yeah, personally, but I, I'm not going to talk to talk to the rest of for, for the rest of Twitter. So you see more hate speech personally. I would say I would see more hateful content in that in that content probably. you don't like or or hateful. What do you mean to describe a hateful thing? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, just content that will solicit. A reaction, something that may include something that is slightly racist or slightly sexist. Those kinds of those kinds of things. So you think if I'm, something is slightly sexist, it should be banned? 
I, no, is I'm that not, what you're saying? I'm not saying anything. I'm saying. Well, I'm just curious. What you, I'm, just, I'm trying to understand what you mean by hateful con content, and I'm asking for specific examples. Um, and if, and you just said that if something is slightly sexist, that's hateful content. Does that mean that it should be banned? Well, you've asked me. You've asked me whether my feed, whether it's got less or more. It, I'd say it's got slightly more. That's what I'm asking for examples. Can, right. you name, can you name one example? I, I honestly don't. You I, I, honestly, I you don't. You can't name I, a single example. I'll tell you why. Because I don't actually use that for you feed anymore. Because I, I just don't particularly like it. But you and said actually, a lot of people. A lot of people are quite similar. I, I, I only. Well, well, I only look well, at hang my, on a second. My you said you've seen more hateful content, but you can't name a single example. Not even one. I'm not sure I've used that feed for the last three or four weeks. And I. Well, then how did you see the hateful content? content? Because I've been I've been using I've been using Twitter since you've taken it over for the last six months. Okay, so then you must have at some point seen that you for you hateful content. I'm asking for one example. Right, and, and I, you can't I, give us a single one. And, and, and I'm saying, I, I, then I, I say, sir, that you don't know what you're talking about. Really? Yes, because you can't give me a single example of hateful con a content, not even one tweet, and yet you claimed that the hateful content was high. Well, that's a false. No, what I claimed, you just lied. What no no what I claim was. Uh, there are many uh, organizations that say that that kind of information is on the rise. Now, whether whether it has on my feed or example. not, I mean, I, right? And you can look at something one. like the, the uh, Strategic Dialogue uh, Institute in the, U in the UK. They will say that. So you, they, look, it's, people will say all sorts of nonsense. I'm literally asking for a right. single example, and you can't name one. Right. And as, as I've already said, I don't use that feed. But let's, well, then how would you know that? I don't you, think this is getting anywhere. You literally said you experienced more hateful content. And then couldn't name a single example. Right, and as I said, I that's absurd. I haven't, I haven't actually looked at that feed. I then how would you know this hateful content? Because I'm saying that's what I saw a few weeks ago. I can't give you an exact example. Let's move on. We have, we only have a certain amount of time. Um, wow. Well, COVID misinformation. Wow. Well, COVID misinformation. You changed, the COVID, you changed the COVID misinformation. Has course. BBC changed this COVID misinformation? The BBC does not set the rules on Twitter, so I'm asking you. No, I'm talking about the BBC's misinformation about COVID. I'm, I'm, I'm literally Has asking you about, you changed the labels, the COVID misinformation labels. There used to be a policy, and then it then disappeared. Why, why do that? Well, COVID is no longer an issue. Does the BBC uh, hold itself at all responsible for misinformation re re regarding ma masking and, and side effects of vaccinations and not reporting on that at all? And what about the fact that the BBC was put under pressure by the British government to change its editorial policy? Are you aware of that? This is, a, this is not an interview about the BBC. Oh, so. you thought it wasn't? <laughs> and this, I see now why you've done Twitter Spaces. I am not a representative of the BBC's editorial policy. I want to make that clear. Let's talk about something else. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, OK, look, let me, I mean, there's lots going on there. I'll just do a short bit on this. Uh, the piece that he did there, this is not an interview about the BBC. That's, that is the phrase that he should have used a long time back, like four videos ago, he should have said, this is not an interview about me. This is not about an interview about the BBC. Let's get back to you, Elon, and, and, and controlled it. So he's too late with that phrase. It's a good stock phrase. It's a good technique, but no technique, however good, is going to work if you're late to the game, late for the game. I think it's about like, I don't know, seven 7-1 to, to Musk at the moment. It's uh, it's more than a hat trick. It's uh, I've never seen a score like it. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? Well, Mark, I, the other problem is when you get to the point where your, your thinking brain is not working, when your parasympathetic and sympathetic are fighting and your body brain wins over your thinking brain, guess what happens? Then you can't finish sentences and we hear all that in the last one. It takes a while to recover from that. So his brain is still not in the right place. And this might be a grasp force, a floating object. But you're right. If he had done this earlier, even last round, he would have been better off. <clears throat> because Musk can see that this guy's turned to run. You can see amusement in his face. You can see his upper face is smiling, lower face not so much. Watch that phone come up as a barrier. I was talking about this earlier. He's been holding a phone here, and now it's up here. He feels the stress. You can see it. See his respiration is up. He's dropping his hand constantly now. His hand is falling. You hear it hitting his leg as opposed to what, putting his hand back quietly. That's 
<laughs> that's already starting to show defeat. And he's pursing his lips. That's frustration, I think, we see in his pursed lips. And then all that Musk does is sidestep the question and say, did you do it? He does do the right thing, like you said, and wins back out. This guy is back to adapting in his abdomen. Um, Scott, I'm with you. Did he use the wrong soap? Is he constantly doing that? Does he just need training? Look, look us up. We'll show you how to avoid that. But don't do that. That is telegraphing your insecurity. In, in my days of teaching project managers and construction people, we would always teach them and we would do role play to teach them how to deal with conflict. And we would say, cover your belly button because I'm going to punch you right in the gut. And that's maybe what's going on in his head is he's protecting himself. Scott, what do you got? Yeah, I don't, don't tell him to get a hold of us because he wouldn't listen. You know, we <laughs> did not what lie. we told him. He did a lot of nodding <laughs> going on. He wouldn't take anything, no intake on that. So now Elon's getting a little bit, I don't think he's angry, but I think he's getting riled up right here because his breathing rate increases, his nostrils flare a little bit. We see a lot of lip person on him as well because he doesn't he he doesn't agree with with what the other guy what the interviewer is is saying and he's he's really he's i think he's really showing again a lot of control here i think he's showing um i think it'd be tough to, to stay under control when you're when this guy's talking about something you've put so much into and this guy's bad mouthing it and you're 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 fighting him or fussing with him about it so but even though he his his Voice uh, tone has stayed the same. Everything's pretty much the same. He's talking a little bit fast <clears throat> compared to what he was talking in this last video. He's speeding up a little bit, and um, then he has those long pauses after the statements. So I think that's that's another because he knows he's winning, so he can do that. The other guy has nothing. He's just he's just swinging. He's flailing around. Swinging. He's got nothing. And when he's and when it comes up about the B, the BBC and the editorial policy, that's when Musk's right foot comes out. And it goes forward and it presses down and pats a couple of times. And I think that's when he knows he's scoring against this guy. He's laying down fire that this guy can't put out or he can't protect himself against. So I think those are the the confidence cues we're seeing on him right there. Chase, what do you got? Watch this guy, this reporter's abdomen as the clip gets started here. He's started to almost hyperventilate. And in keeping with his baseline, he's trying very hard to conceal it. While Elon is not. So if Elon decides to take a breath or adjust himself, he doesn't try to conceal it. And that's a huge difference here between these two people. This guy goes into almost fight or flight mode here. He wasn't expecting any of this. And you can see him panicking, even looking at the camera crew for confirmation or maybe rescue. I'm not sure which one. And you can see that his feet still haven't moved from under the chair this whole time. He's trying to lock his behavior down. And you'll see this in people who have an unconscious belief that their natural normal behavior isn't good enough or isn't appropriate to be on camera. So this hidden belief makes those people unconsciously try to control and restrain natural behaviors like this. And this is why even if you watch this on mute, you're still going to get a weird feeling, uh, like a gut feeling or an intuition, that there's something artificial. There's something fake uh, to this person or persons like that. One of those tape replays. Well, wow. COVID misinformation. You changed the COVID, you changed the COVID misinformation. Has rules. BBC changed this COVID misinformation? The BBC does not set the rules on Twitter, so I'm asking you. No, I'm talking about the BBC's misinformation about COVID. I'm, I'm, I'm literally Has, asking you about, you change the labels, the COVID misinformation labels. They used to be a policy, and then it then disappeared. Why, why do that? Well, COVID is no longer an issue. Does the BBC uh, hold itself at all responsible for misinformation re regarding ma masking and, and side effects of vaccinations? and not reporting on that at all. And what about the fact that the BBC was put under pressure by the British government to change its editorial policy? Are you aware of that? And this is a, this is not an interview about the BBC. Oh, so. you thought it wasn't? <laughs> and this, I see now why you've done Twitter Spaces. I am not a representative of the BBC's editorial policy. I want to make that clear. Let's talk about something else. Um, I want to talk about if you have any regret, regrets. And, and 
you know, I think you, you were booed at a Dave Chappelle concert. I think your own lawyer said a little, said, a, little a little. Well, some say a little, some say a bit more. Um, I, I think your own lawyer said you couldn't get a fair trial in San Francisco because there are lots of people that, that don't necessarily like you here. Yeah, but the, I, you know, I have to say yeah. I, I was wrong. He was wrong, I guess. The uh, because um, I was acquitted uh, by the San Francisco jury unanimously. So, yeah. But, but I guess, but look, do, in, yeah, do, no, do, do you have any regrets about buying Twitter? Um, I think it was something that uh, needed to be done. Um, I mean, so it's you, been, you it's said been quite you... difficult, you know. It's, uh, I'd say that, like, the, the pain level of Twitter has been extremely high. Um, this hasn't been some sort of party. Um, so uh, it's been really quite a stressful situation. Uh, you know, the last several months, not not an easy one. I, I, um, I but apart from the pain, I mean, y so it's been quite painful. Um, but I think uh, at the end of the day, it it should have been done. I think did I, were there many mistakes made along the way? Of course, I'm, you know. Um, and uh, but at, you know, all's well that ends well. And so I I, I feel like uh, we're headed uh, to a good place. Um, you know, we're roughly break even. I think we're trending towards being cash flow positive very soon, like literally in a matter of, of, of months. Um, the advertisers are returning. Um, the, I think the quality of recommended tweets has improved significantly and we've taken a lot of feedback from uh, people that have looked at the open source recommendation algorithm and we've, we've made a lot of improvements even, even since that was uh, made open source and we're going to keep doing that. So. Overall, I think the trend is uh, very good. So, uh, you know. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, let's look at the reporter first. He's back to telling hands now. Look at his fingers and thumbs are spread. He's got facts, so he's going at him. And then <clears throat> when he's saying that you didn't have a chance of getting a fair trial, you can see Musk telegraph disagreement, set jaw, purse lips, back against the chair, and a rigid posture. So you know he's going to come back with something. And you can see this, this reporter is pleased with himself because you can see a real smile come back. Not that nervous, toothy, panicky smile we saw just a few minutes ago. And Musk is not really clear and really confident because he has a trailing answer and and he just is not exactly himself there. His hands back in the adapter rubbing his leg. Now, they ask him a hard question. Do you have regrets? What do I think? Yes. Because he's got new patterns of adapting and rubbing his legs. He purses his lips. He drums his thumbs. His left hand is in a new position we haven't seen. There's a changing cadence, and he's navigating language as he slows down to figure it out. He lilts when he says it needed doing, and he didn't answer the question, not once. That means that likely, yes, he has regrets. Now, whether those regrets are big enough to make him want to get rid of the company is a different story. Then after he gets past the question and back to, face, uh, back to facts, you'll get to a point where his cadence and his confidence increase. That's what we're seeing. Scott, what do you got? All right. I agree. And there are a lot of firsts here um, in, in this one. So let's pay, pay close attention to his hands and feet. This introspective uh, question about Twitter, you're right. I think it makes him uncomfortable. He has, he, I think he, because of all he had to go through to get to get up, get it to where it is is now. The, this is the first time we, I think, we see his arms actually as barriers. Not that he needs to protect himself against the guy, but I think he's 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 barriering. But at the same time, it's that odd um, self soothing thing he's doing, self pacification. But because of, of what he's thinking about up in there, up in, up in that head of his, um, he's got his feet pulled under the chair and they're crossed. And about halfway through, he pulls he he pulls him even further under the chair. So I think as it goes along, he gets a little bit more comfortable. He's going a lot of lip pursing, um, much more than there has been up to this point. Um, and his steeple is very low, too. He's got that going on. Then he starts rubbing his legs. He's got that finger roll, that, that multi tap thing going on in his leg. He's just really uncomfortable. And I think at the end when when, when he says, uh, when Elon says it's hurtful, um, he's adapting again and um, pacifying with that hand to his neck um, or to that neck area, you know, up there in, in the top there. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, this is the best place the interviewer gets Musk to. I think completely by by accident and doesn't really pick up on it, doesn't observe, doesn't observe and then take control. And so really doesn't 
take him where he, he could. Here's what happens, I think. Um, the, the interviewer starts with an ad hominem attack, attacks the man, goes, people booed you, basically goes, people don't like you, do they? Um, and and Musk, as, as cold as you might think he sometimes appears, that is not likely to be true for his internal feelings. In fact, they could be very strongly uh, in the opposite uh, to that. He may respond... Um, you know, quite extremely to the idea of 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 not being liked. So he does go down the route of going, actually, you know, there's a whole jury who seemed to like me and go in my favour. Then he starts talking about buying potentially what is the most socially malignant platform in the history of humankind. It's a platform that if you want people to be nasty to you, Twitter is traditionally the one. Yeah, he buys that and he says the pain level has been extremely high. So he names the feeling pain and extremely high, quite stressful situation, quite painful. He, he keeps reiterating this idea of painful and his body language has changed. His tone has changed. His rhythm uh, has changed. And... Um, and so the interviewer here, he says there should there, there have been mistakes as well. The interviewer here should at this point understand what's going on and take control. Tell me exactly what was most painful about this. What event was most painful? To get into that, you get more information out of it. Well, he doesn't, doesn't take control of it. And so here's what happens is Musk manages to get straight on to his uh, his set piece, which is the trend for Twitter is very good. The stock is doing well. It's, it's great. So because it wasn't taken control of, the emotional state uh, dissipates and he goes straight for um, uh, a set piece, gets his stock piece out there, opportunity lost, complete disaster. Chase, what do you got? Chase, Chase. This reporter was just consistently scratching his belly, fake nodding, pretending to listen, scratching his face, checking his phone while someone is talking to him. While someone's talking to him. And it, it's just awful to watch. And it's just more of the same. It's two people who are both feeling insecure. One of them is open about it. And one of them is desperately trying to restrain, control, and conceal it uh, while wearing kind of a broken mask of maturity and composure. I think that's the mask uh, that we're seeing on the right side of the screen uh, that, as you're watching there. That's all I got here. Greg? Chase, the one thing, no, I've already gone, but the one thing I would say He's not just talking to a person. He's talking to a guy who could choose to use his first or last name and still be Elvis. Yeah, you know who he was. <clears throat> yeah, I kept I kept laughing because uh, I kept for some reason I went to thinking if I was looking through all those holes in the hotel room because I know you're in a hotel room, Mark. And when you look through out the door and you look through that little hole, if you were standing there talking, saying exactly what you're saying, as I was looking at you through that little hole, it was so weird, man. I don't know where that came from, but it hit me. And I couldn't get it out of my head. <laughs> you're so close. It just I could probably. Oh no, I can't quite do it. That's what know. it looks like, though. Okay, you talk about the door, yeah. yeah. I make a little... Oh. Oh. Yeah, the little peephole. I'll try and do that for you later. One of those tape replays. Um, I want to talk about if you have any regret, regrets. And, and, you know, I think you, you were booed at a Dave Chappelle concert. I think your own lawyer a said... Little. A little. A little, well... Some say a little, some say a bit more. Um, I think your own lawyer said you couldn't get a fair trial in San Francisco because there are lots of people that, that don't necessarily like you here. Yeah, but the, I, you know, I have to say I, I was wrong. He was wrong, I guess, the, uh, because um, I was acquitted uh, by the San Francisco jury unanimously. So, yeah. But, but I guess, but look, do, yeah, do, no, do, do you have any regrets by buying Twitter? Um, I think it was something that uh, needed to be done. Um, I mean, so it's you, been, you it's said been quite that you... difficult, you know. It's, uh, I'd say that, like, the, the pain level of Twitter has been extremely high. Um, this hasn't been some sort of party. Um, so, uh, 
it's been really quite a stressful situation, at, you know, for the last several months. Not not an easy one. I, I, um, but apart from the pain, I mean, so it's been quite painful. Um, but I think uh, at the end of the day, it it should have been done. I think did I, were there many mistakes made along the way? Of course, I'm, you know, um, and. Uh, but you know, all's well that ends well, and so I, I, I feel like uh, we're headed uh, to a good place. Um, you know, we're roughly break even. I think we're trending towards being cash flow positive very soon, like literally in a matter of of, of months. Um, the advertisers are returning. Um, the I think the quality of recommended tweets has improved significantly, and we've taken a lot of feedback from uh, people that have looked at the open source. A recommendation algorithm, and we've we've made a lot of improvements even even since that was uh, made open source, and we're going to keep doing that. So overall, I think the trend is uh, very good. So uh, you know, I mean, I, it was actually something I was going to ask you. You mentioned the pain, but but you actually tweeted, uh, I think in February, you said the the last three months have been extremely tough. I wouldn't wish that pain on anyone. Could, are you talking emotionally? That. I mean, yeah. can, you, can, you, can you explain? I wasn't stabbed or anything. Right, right. Like but some people around here, it's just dangerous neck of the woods we're in. It is, or it can be. But just can you just talk me through the emotional strain of this? Yeah, I mean, look, I'm under, I've been under constant attack. I mean, uh, it's not like I, you know, have a stone cold heart or something like that. You know, uh, if, if, if you're under constant criticism and attack, it's and then that that gets fed to you nonstop, including through Twitter, um, that uh, it's rough, you know. Um, now, now, at the end of the day, I kind of think that like if you do lose your feedback loop, that's that's actually not good. Um, so, uh, you know. Uh, if, 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 so I think it's, it is imp actually important to get negative feedback. Um, I don't turn replies off, and I actually got rid of, I, I removed my entire block list, so I don't block anyone either. Um, so, so somebody can, you know, so, so I get like <laughs> a lot of negative feedback. Um, what, 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 but what, I think it's actually your... good to get negative feedback. You know? Right. Um, is it, when you talk about the, the emotional strain, you've gone back to feedback. Is, is that the thing that's been most difficult to take, the sort of negative feedback? Yeah, I mean, if if if, uh, if the media is writing nonstop stories about why you're a horrible person, I mean, it's, you know, um, it's, it's uh, hurtful, obviously. <laughs> All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is a great one because of a handful of things. Number one, Elon Musk respiration goes up. You can see it. His actually his respiration goes up when he's talking about people attacking him and that kind of thing. He's talking about a violent area. He doesn't do it then. But when he starts talking about him, you see that. And then he starts to adapt more. He's rubbing his leg or grabbing his leg. His legs, Chase, to your point earlier about who feels safe, his legs are pinned under his chair at, at the beginning of this. And he shows helplessness as he talks about under constant attack. He's got more than normal eye contact. Now, this is one of the few times I'm pretty certain this is emotional eye accessing because I think he does a lot of break eye contact to get out of eye contact because of the autism. But in this case, his eyes are down and dwelling as he's talking about something. So not breaking eye contact and they're there. He does really hard eye contact until he talks about the hard part of it. His eyes drop. He's got a nervous smile. Then you see him relax. And when he's asked a question about how it feels, he goes back to that other pontificate move where he crosses his body and he goes into what I was saying earlier is contemplating and he starts to talk. And one of the most powerful things I've seen so far, when he says something's hurtful, he covers his throat. I think it's true. I think we're seeing genuine behavior from a guy who may or may not even understand some of the social cues. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I think there's just this speaks to one thing that you'll see when Elon is asked in an earlier interview of how he felt when Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong were disapproving of him starting a space company. And he cried talking about how uh, that that hurt his feelings, uh, that that his heroes disapproved of him. And I think Elon, uh, as, as tough as he is to I could I couldn't deal with the news articles like that published about me every day. I don't think I could deal with that. Uh, but he still thrives on acceptance and some kind of approval, but I think more acceptance, being accepted and, and liked. And I think that is the most injurious thing to him is this uh, mass uh, disapproval of him. You're definitely seeing that here. Mark? 
Uh, yeah, I'm not going to add uh, anything much to this, but I do want to try and see whether I can give you the the effect that you're looking for there, Scott. Hang on. Of looking at me <laughs> through the peephole. Of I just, I just, start ta- just start talking. Just start talking about body language, doing that. Just be all serious. Be, yeah. Be okay. Mark, so, so what we do see in this is Musk... Uh, his foot does come forward when he speaks on these more emotional uh, areas. <laughs> dream nice come true, man. Dream come That's true. I mean, I, it was actually something I was going to ask you. You mentioned the pain, but but you actually tweeted, uh, I think in February, you said the the last three months have been extremely tough. I wouldn't wish that pain on anyone. Could, are you talking emotionally there? I mean, yeah. I, can you can you can you explain? I wasn't stabbed or anything. Right, right. Like but, some people around here, it's just dangerous neck of the woods we're in. It is. Or it can be. But just can you just talk me through the emotional sh- strain of this? Yeah, I mean, look, I'm under. I've been under constant attack. I mean, uh, it's not like I, you know, have a stone cold heart or something like that. You know, uh, if, if if you're under constant criticism, attack, it's and then that that gets fed to you nonstop, including through Twitter. Um, that uh, it's rough. You know, um, no, no. At the end of the day, I kind of think that, like, if you do lose your feedback loop, that's that's actually not good. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, if, if so, I think it's it is actually important to get negative feedback. Um, I don't turn replies off, and I actually got rid of I, I removed my entire block list, so I don't block anyone either. Um, so, so somebody can, you know, so so I get like. <laughs> A lot of negative feedback. Um, what, what's but been, I think it's actually your... good to get negative feedback. You right. Know? Um, is it, when you talk about the, the emotional strain, you've gone back to feedback. Is, is that the thing that's been most difficult to take, the sort of negative feedback? Yeah, I mean, if, 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 uh, if the media is writing nonstop stories about why you're a horrible person, I mean, you know, um, it's, it's uh, hurtful, obviously. <laughs> What are you looking for in terms of uh, in terms of a revenue stream on that? What are your goals? Well, I, I, I don't know if it's like necessarily a giant revenue stream. Um, you know, because even if you have, if you have sort of a million uh, people that are subscribed for let's say a hundred dollars a year ish, that's a uh, hundred million dollars, um, and uh, that's that's a, that's a fairly small revenue stream relative to advertising. Um, but what we're all we're really trying to do here with uh, verification is to massively raise the cost of disinformation and and, and bots in general. Um, so my prediction is that any social media company that does not uh, insist on paid verification will simply be overwhelmed uh, by uh, advanced AI bots. I mean, ChatGPT is essentially a, a zillion instances of ChatGPT. How is do you that even really know? what you want on the platform? Do you want? Big news organizations being overwhelmed by bots so that they have to pay. No, the some point money. is that you, you won't be. If you pay. But a lot of organizations have already said they're not going to pay, like the New York Times. Well, then, you know, that's up to them if they, you know, can make them pay. Um, it's a small amount of money, so I don't know what, what their problem is. Um, so, uh, but uh, we're going to treat everyone equally. So, what, what we're not going to do is say that there's some anointed class. Uh, of journalists who are the special ones who get to tell everyone what they're what what they, what they should think, that it, it should be up to the people what they think, um, and e- even if an article is completely accurate and um, comprehensive and everything, if they're still in in writing that article. The media is choosing the narrative. They're they're deciding what to write an article about. Um, so I'm hopeful that, the, that this can be more a case of the public choosing the narrative as opposed to the media choosing the narrative. But the media can choose the narrative, at least, at least a combination of the media and the public choosing the narrative. Um, and the, the public getting to, to weigh in on stories if they, if they think that they should add something to it or uh, we've got something wrong. And over time, I think if Twitter is the best source of truth, it will succeed. And if, and if we are not the best source of truth, we will fail. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, the only important thing for me here is is the messaging uh, that he's using here. He starts talking about verification. His hands come up to the to the truth plane to 
to uh, the stomach area. He starts to steeple. He's in symmetry there. He's down what I call the wheel plane. So he's suggesting to us, look, I'm completely aligned on this. This is my message that that verification uh, is the goal. But actually, he's up in passion more than more than truth. Um, so he's he's excited and and clear and consistent about this idea of verification because he's just this is his message this is what he's come to do is deliver this message now then he starts with a, a in, potentially an even bigger message and i don't know quite whether he's worked this one out in his head but his metaphors are interesting uh, that there shouldn't be an anointed class of journalist well so anointed if you're anointed that means you're a monarch so he's saying there shouldn't be monarchs of journalism essentially what's quite ironic is he's using quite kind of Marxist rhetoric, the idea of a class system and some having more power than others. He's using that on on what he would expect to be a slightly more left-wing leaning journalist. So he's using the class system on that journalist, which would tend to be what that journalist would try and use on him. Again, he's completely reversed the usual ideas on him. That's pretty clever. Uh, but I don't think it's a, a left and right wing uh, situation here. What, what, what the battle is here, I think, is new media versus old media. And therefore, the idea of the the uh, the New York Post not paying for verification um, doesn't cost very much. Well, it's not about cost. It's about they don't want power to shift. So I think that's what he's talking about here. He's very clear about uh, people don't like new power. Um, and and uh, and I think he's pointing out that this journalist might be part of the old power system, that old power system that was pretty nasty to him, maybe even more nasty than his own platform has been to him. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, the, the thing I do like here, I agree with you, there's all kinds of stuff going on, all the politics of it. But the thing I do like is when he's talking about being truthful and this being the most reliable or best source of the truth, he goes back to that contemplating thing. It's not responsive. This is not reactive. This is him thinking. And he's thinking. You can hear him walking through it. Now we're back to my initial posit, and that was, are we talking to Lex Luthor? Are we talking to Tony Stark? So th now we're getting into areas where we want to know what he really thinks and what his motivation is. It looks truthful. It looks truthful to your point. All of his hands and everything are in the right place. I don't think, I think parts of it are certainly structured and scripted. You're right on Mark with his hands up and doing all that truth playing part of it. Some of it, the other pieces though, I think is he's thinking through it. He's actually thinking we've seen what he does when he goes into that thoughtful process. So I think we're seeing genuine and he really does think that the most important thing he'll do is to become the most trusted piece of truth. And you're right. If you think old media, new media, it's too late to be thinking old media, new media. It's already over at that point. Chase, what do you got? I don't have anything for this. I just think we'll be, our great grandchildren will be talking about Musk. Will, they will still be talking about him 150 years from now. Scott? Yeah, I agree. I agree with you. I think that the, the, the thing that stuck out the most to me was that steeple that was way up front in the front of his chest there when he's talking about that. I think it's his his ultimate confidence at that point. And then when the interviewer tries that, I'll talk for a minute and ask a question and just pause a long pause because it'll make him uncomfortable. He'll start talking. It didn't work. <laughs> he got so uncomfortable. He had to start talking again. So it, did, it didn't it didn't work on him. This I, I think they, sh they should have sent in somebody else to do this. So anyway, but after that, then I think Elon goes back to his baseline. And the question is is important and, and exciting for the interviewer. He thinks he's really got him something here. And so we see all his little things of, of excitement. He can't keep his hands out of his beard. He can't quit squirming around and moving around. He's itching everywhere. And then, the, then Elon plays that you're smarter than me game, and this guy loses. He, he he's not I don't I don't know I, I feel like I was bad mouthing this guy I don't I don't mean to be but he didn't do a very good job and I couldn't do that, that good a job as he did I mean trying to interview Elon Musk are you kidding me so he was yeah, better than me yes you could have <laughs> <laughs> yeah I don't know that guy that guy's a, a pro interviewer but you know but he, he, I don't know I just feel I feel bad for bad mouthing that guy so much because I'm just wailing on him All he right, is good? pro in title alone. One of those tape replays.
What are you looking for in terms of uh, in terms of a revenue stream on that? What are your goals? Well, I, I don't know if it's like necessarily a giant revenue stream. Um, you know, because even if you have, if you have sort of a million uh, people that are subscribed for let's say a hundred dollars a year ish, that's a uh, hundred million dollars. Um, and uh, that's that's a that's a fairly small revenue stream relative to advertising. Um, but what we're all we're really trying to do here with uh, verification is to massively raise the cost of disinformation and and, and bots in general. Um, so my prediction is that any social media company that does not uh, insist on paid verification will simply be overwhelmed uh, by uh, advanced AI bots. I mean, ChatGPT is essentially a, a zillion instances of ChatGPT. How is do you that even really know? what you want on the platform? Do you want big news organizations being overwhelmed by bots so that they have to pay you No, the you point money? is that you, you won't be. If you pay. But a lot of organizations have already said they're not going to pay, like the New York Times. Well, then, you know, that's up to them if they, you know, can make them pay. Um, it's a small amount of money, so I don't know what, what their problem is. Um, so, uh, but uh, we're going to treat everyone equally. So what, what we're not going to do is say that there's some anointed class uh, of journalists who are the special ones who get to tell everyone what, they're, what, what, they, what they should think, that it, it should be up to the people what they think. Um, and even if an article is completely accurate and um, comprehensive and everything, if they're still in, in writing that article, the media is choosing the narrative. They're, they're deciding what to write an article about. Um, so I'm hopeful that, the, that this can be more a case of the public choosing the narrative as opposed to the media choosing the narrative. And the media can choose narr at, least, at least a combination of the media and the public choosing the narrative. Um, and the, the public getting to, to weigh in on stories if they, if they think that they should add something to it or if uh, we've got something wrong. And over time, I think if Twitter is the best source of truth, it will succeed. And if, and if we are not the best source of truth, we will fail. Someone comes in and offers you $44 billion for Twitter right now. Would you take it? No. Would you consider it? No. Why? Uh, well, I, I, I take it back. It depends on who. I suppose if, if I was confident that they would pursue, that would, they, would, they would rigorously pursue the truth, um, then, I, then I, I guess I guess I would be glad to hand it off to someone else. I don't care about the money, really, but I I, I do want to have a, some source of truth that I can count on, um, and and I, I hope that's our aspiration with with Twitter is to have you know, a source of truth that you can count on. Uh, that's, that's, it's also real time. It's an, an immediate source of truth that you can count on and that gets more accurate with time as people comment on a particular thing. Well, if you don't care about the money, you could just give it to someone that you, that you think is uh, a, you know, a good person to run Twitter. Who do you think that might be? I, I, I'm not the okay. boss of Twitter. No, but it's just, well, that's, you might still have an idea. Who, who could run Twitter? Yes. I, I, honestly, I have no idea who could run Twitter. Yeah, it's a hard job. Okay, let's. I mean, let's move on to. You said that you were going to um, stand down. As I already have. Chief executive, right? Okay. All right, Chase. What do you got? This is uh, maybe just an absence of integrity. I don't. I don't know what to say about it. You know, I've seen. Haven't seen this in a long time. He's got this line of. Let's move on. Every single time he's asked for a single shred of personal thought, real ideas, or anything that isn't on his phone screen uh, for him to read. The body language is pretty much the same. Elon's mostly open. The reporter guy is uh, insecure. They're both insecure. But he's kind of lacking in self-worth, self-esteem, and self-confidence. And Elon knows this. And when the reporter says uh, he can just give Twitter away, the look of self-satisfaction on his face is priceless. This mouth closure, there's a little smirk on his face, and he's tapping his fingers on his knee here, uh, indicate a tiny spike in his confidence. He thinks he's got a good strategy here until Elon essentially shows him that it's 
that he maybe doesn't have one. Uh, Greg, what do you think? Yeah, I'm going to stick on Musk here. Um, he's got congruent internal voices. He's thinking about how to answer the question. You see his eyes drift down into his left. Then he goes into thinking pose. Again, that same pose we've seen to just anytime there's something that requires contemplation. And anytime he's doing that stream of consciousness, and he clearly is here when he says, one source of truth, real time, immediate. That's him thinking and changing as he speaks. And this is him being honest and congruent, I think. So we're seeing now what's his motivation. There's two elements back to back that talk about his motivation and why he's doing things. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so it's an interesting area here of ethical aspiration, like who should run something very, very powerful. And um, well, I mean, who should who should run it? Uh, he's put forward an idea earlier, which is it should be some kind of more democratic per process between the media and people uh, already. But the interviewer is on him around, tell us who you think should run this. Uh, he turns it back on the interviewer. Again, the interviewer shouldn't accept that and doesn't. He says, look, I'm not the, I'm not the CEO. It's not my, it's not my responsibility. And, and but then carries on to say, look, genuinely, I just don't know. Now, here's what's interesting about Musk is that he is socially aware enough to kind of play a good joke, which he looks down and to the right uh, in a kind of an emotional way and says, yeah, it's a it's a hard job. I I don't think <laughs> I think it's just a good joke that he's playing there, knowing that that the you know a trap was sprung. And it uh, and it trapped the interviewer um, right where he needed him. Certainly, sm socially smart enough to be able to do that downright motion before delivering the punchline uh, of the trap. I don't think he's really in an emotional state about how hard a job it is. I think just think he likes the idea of that's where the conversation went. There, that's all I got on that one. <laughs> one of those tape replays someone comes in and, and offers you 44 billion dollars for twitter right now would you take it no would you consider it no why uh well uh, I, I, I take it back it depends on who i suppose if, if i was confident that they would pursue that would they, they would rigorously pursue the truth um then I then I, I guess I guess I would be glad to hand it off to someone else. I don't care about the money really, but I I, I do want to have a, some source of truth that I can count on, um, and and I, I hope that's our aspiration with with Twitter is to have you know, a source of truth that you can count on. Uh, that's that's it's also real time. It's an, an immediate source of truth that you can count on, and that gets more accurate with time as people comment on a particular thing. Well, if you don't care about the money, you could just give it to someone that you that you think is uh, you know, a good person to run Twitter. Who do you think that might be? I, I, I'm not the okay. boss of Twitter. No, but it's just, well, that's you might still have an idea. Who, who could run Twitter? Yes. Uh, I, honestly, I have no idea who could run Twitter. Yeah, it's a hard job. Uh, okay, let's. I mean, let's move on to. You've said that you were going to um, stand down. As I already have. Chief executive, right? Okay. Um, what's the most difficult thing you've had to do? What's the hardest thing you've had to do? In my whole life. Or? In the last six months. Oh. We're talking about. <laughs> we're talking about the last six months as you as, as Twitter boss here. Twitter owner. Um, well, shutting down uh, our one of our service centers was was quite difficult because it turns out there were um, I, I thought the service centers were redundant, uh, but uh, there were in fact a lot of things that were hard coded to this one service center, and so when we shut it down, we actually uh, it was quite catastrophic. We lost a lot of functionality, which sort of re really rushed to put it back. When was that? And that was around late December, early January. So that that was the biggest sort of I'm I'm worried here. Big, biggest crisis, yeah. Yeah. And what about hard in terms of emotional? I mean, I mean, is letting go. I mean, what, what were the current the, step, the levels of staff, and what are they now? Um, I think we're um, around fifteen hundred people at this point. 
And there was, I think, 7,800. What was, it, what was that saying? I, I think it was around just under 8,000, and 8, we're about 1,500 right now. Okay. And it, it, has it been hard letting that, that many people go? Yeah. Not fun at all. It's painful. I mean, it, I guess in, in what way do you, do you feel like you need to speak to people when they, when, when they leave? Or? I mean, it's not physically possible to speak to that many people. Mm. Mm. Has, has that, I mean, you talked about that being the most technical bit. Is that, has, has that been sort of the hardest thing emotionally, or is, is it? Is it's one of the hardest things, certainly, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You can go. Wait a minute. Okay. All right, well, I'll go first. <laughs> I won't be able to do this now. <laughs> um, all right, Chase, what do you got? Uh, Elon is just consistently answering these questions in this this guy isn't listening whatsoever. This is one of the worst interviewers I've seen in a while. Maybe needs some more training. Maybe he's just in over his head. Maybe he had a rough night. I don't know. Maybe they got those chairs from the best Western. I don't know. But uh, there's no dialogue. If throughout, in, in most good interviewers, even if they're hard-nosed and hard line, there's dialogue back and forth and not just... I need to get back to my phone so I can see the next question here. And the only interesting point here that really shines a light on this, according to me anyway, is where the reporter guy asks about whether Elon thinks about uh, talking to these people as they leave uh, the company again. Elon reminds him of the fact that it's not physically possible. Like, it's just a fact. The reporter's response is just a grunt. Uh, like that. Not even processing the response from Elon whatsoever. Uh, and I think that sums up the entire thing. Like, there's facts and well-thought-out reasoning and zero uh, reflection uh, in the reporter. There is zero dialogue. He has not really consciously processed uh, almost every single thing that Elon has said. Uh, Scott, what do you got? All right. Yeah, I agree with you 100% on all that. And I think at, at this point, we're getting back to the normal baseline for Elon that we saw at the beginning. So his illustrators are low. They're not as 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 big, and, and they don't move as fast as they were before. They've slowed down a little bit. And his voice tone is lower, and so is his voice volume. And the big change up, though, is that, that clasped hands, his clasped hands that, that come in. And I think that's more because he's when, when he's talking about you're talking about firing people, you're talking about letting people off, all those kind of things. I think that's that's a little stressful for him. Um, his feet move forward from under the chair. I think the retreat is over from the bus he was having uh, earlier. And then and then the interviewer says, "Is it hard letting that many people go?" And he immediately says, "Yeah." And then we see that little shoulder thing and the shoulder pulls forward it's not a shrug it doesn't go up it pulls forward i think it's because it was stressful for him and you know how you feel um stress in your back right there oh, it hurts right here i think that was actually stressful for him probably not all of them because i'm sure there are some people that would in this situation would need to be let go but some people that didn't and i'm sure he knew that that there was going to be fallout from that of quote unquote innocent people who aren't going to have jobs and weren't going to be able to, to, you know, feed their families and all that kind of thing. So then after the question, um, do you feel you should talk to people instead of talking to people when they're fired? You're right, Chase. He said, no, it's, it's physically impossible. And after he does that, that's the biggest head nod we see so far, that confirmation nod, which is, which is one of his, like I was saying earlier, it's how he finishes his statement says I'm finished or I'm done right there. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I don't have a whole lot on this one. There are just a handful of things. This Chase, I think this guy sees this as an assignment, not as a get to, a have to, not get to. Because if he wanted, I think if somebody told me he's a tech editor or a tech reporter. Yeah. Holy geez, who are you talking to? Simply the most profound thinker in tech and forever among people. Now, people are going to light me up about that and say he's not profound. Look, he's going to put people on Mars. And there's a plan. There's actually activity going on to do it, not a bunch of talk. And in 2028 or in 3030, we're going to do it. So here's a guy that if you look, if I were talking to the guy to have different questions than this, not gotchas, why did you let all these people go? Well, there's clear business reasons that 
You know, they're, they're burning through money so quickly they had four months to live. And he goes into that. He's clear. He's very clear in his approach. I've read that often people who have autism are very literal in their understanding of questions. And that probably is exactly how he responded. Well, I can't. Not I would like to have and, but it's just physically impossible. <clears throat> I'm going to stop right here and just say the last, my favorite thing in this entire piece, this tells you the guy didn't do his homework, is he tries to use silence to get the guy to talk more to a guy who can't read social cues. That tells you didn't prepare well. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, look, if you've made it this far, congratulations, because it's now just exhausting watching this interview because I think you're right, Chase, it, it is, it's terrible. It's just embarrassingly terrible. I think now the interview, you see him kind of scratching, not only at his stomach area, but a little further down, more towards his crotch. He's now kind of, I think, feigning disinterest in what should be a potentially an extraordinary interview. Um, because what an opportunity to have to have must whatever you think of him what an opportunity to be able to question this person um now here's the problem is that is that well one of the problems is that the interviewer keeps looking at his list of questions and i'll tell you this for certain you won't get information out of people with a list of questions. It just won't happen. Why is that the case? It's because human beings and human behavior and psychology is complex. It's not simple. It's not even complicated. It's complex, which means it's a constant dance between you and the other person and all the actions and interactions and past interactions and potential future interactions that are going on. It is fascinatingly complex complex and therefore a linear set of questions is a good start i'm not saying don't have a bunch of questions really good start but if you're really playing into the complexity of it you will leave those questions at some point and he doesn't seem to be able to in fact later on in this interview he can't even remember whether he asked him the regret question or not so he's he's lost even in his own list it's a complete uh, disaster. You know, if you can learn anything from this, just understand it's complex. You can't come. You can come with, with a simple strategy, but know that you're going to give up your strategy once the complexity starts and get dancing with that person. And that would be such a fascinating interview, which unfortunately we don't get to see here. That's all I got on this one. One of those tape replays. Um. What's the most difficult thing you've had to do? What's the hardest thing you've had to do? In my whole life? Or? In the last six months. Oh. We're, talking about, <laughs> we're talking about the last six months as you as Twitter boss here. Twi Twitter owner. Um, well, shutting down uh, our one of our service centers was, was quite difficult because it turns out there were... Uh, I, I thought the service centers were redundant, uh, but uh, there were, in fact, a lot of things that were hard-coded to this one service center and so when we shut it down, we actually, uh, it was quite catastrophic. We lost a lot of functionality, which sort of really rushed to put it back. When was that? And that was around late December, Jan early January. So that, that was the biggest sort of, I'm, I'm worried here. Big, biggest crisis, yeah. Yeah. And what about hard in terms of emotional? I mean, I mean, just letting go. I mean, what, what were the current, the, the levels of staff and what are they now? Um, I think we're um, around 1,500 people at this point, and there was, I think, 7,800. What was that, what was that say? I, I think it was around just under 8,000, and 8, we're about 1,500 right now. Okay. And it, it, has it been hard letting that many people go? Yeah. Not fun at all. It's painful. I mean, I guess in, in what way do you do you feel like you need to speak to people when they when when they leave? Or I mean, it's not physically possible to speak to that many people. Mm. Mm. Has, has that? I mean, you talked about that being the most technical bit. Is that has has that been sort of the hardest thing emotionally, or is, is it? Is... It's one of the hardest things, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Just one more thing. Uh, well, Mark, what do you see so far? What do you think? Well, here's what here's what I think. I hope we can. Uh, do this again sometime and have a look at Elon Musk, but not being interviewed by this particular character. I think what we have seen so far is some true emotion, some feeling, some ideas of ethics, some ideas around leadership 
from him, whether you like them or not, whether you think he's a cool guy or not. I think we did get somewhere into who this person is, but not as far as you could get with a really good interview. I'd like to see that really good interview. If you, if you know of one, like, let us know down below what you think is a great Musk interview, and let's take a look at that. Uh, Chase, Chase, what do you think? I think we should bring him on the show. That's exactly. what I think we should do. But uh, this whole thing is a great example of a person, Elon, who openly acknowledges his social mask and his personal difficulties, uh, talking with another person who isn't even aware that they're faking it. And this person's behavior is very clearly uh, trying to control, mitigate, and manage how they're being perceived and trying to convince you that there's no mask at all, trying to pretend like there's not a mask and pretending perfection. Uh, like we've said many times, or I've said many times in the videos that we've done, and Elon does not care about pretending to be perfect. He's very open about you know all the flaws, even when his rockets crash and stuff going up in space. He'll he posts it himself uh, on social media. It's an interesting uh, mix here, Greg. What do you think so far? Yeah, what I love about this so far <clears throat> is there's a clear baseline, and we can see discomfort and agitation when the issue isn't clear, and he's responding off the cuff. And I call that responsive. You can see that, but he also has a clear baseline when he's thinking through a process. We saw that. He frames an argument. He presents acceptable facts before he closes that argument. And if you don't contribute, then you're accepting his facts. And he nods as he's doing it. That's pretty common for CEOs and people who are executives. Remember, executive means action bias, just by its nature. So a person's going to be more motivated to do that. <clears throat> One of the interesting things that I tried to think about is those last three clips are about motivation. They really are. They're about what made him buy Twitter? Does he believe it's going to be for truth? Would you be willing to sell it just to anybody? And then the last couple were about, why did you do this? Do you have any regrets? So I looked up a couple of quotes from him. And one of them says, I'm motivated, motivated by curiosity more than anything and just desire to think about the future and not be sad. And what that made me think of, Chase, is something you say always, that people are doing their best not to be what they were when they were a child. And I read he had an excruciating childhood, including being beaten up. They called him bookish, you know, South African phrase. But he was beaten up, thrown down concrete stairs, all kinds of stuff in his youth. So he doesn't want that. And the last one would be, he said, if you want the future to be good, you must make it so. Take action to make it good. And it will be when he was asked what to say to young people. That says a lot about what a person's character is, especially when we bonded those last three pieces. So I think maybe we have a Tony Stark and not a Lex Luthor. Scott, what do you got? All right. I think this is awesome because we're seeing somebody who is so smart talk to somebody who's who's probably just average intelligence. And I think it it went on long enough for us to see what he's really like when he laughs and gets the shits and giggles. I I think we actually saw who he was. I don't think we got to see him use his brain power at, to, to even a little bit of it when dealing with this guy when answering questions. I don't think I don't think he he went up in the in the in the the important parts of his brain that that solve all those problems and these were just simple little problems he was solving the things that this guy was presenting him with so for me that's a letdown not being not seeing him actually going and dig into something if this guy had had interviewed tesla nikola tesla it would have been it would have been the same thing he wouldn't know what questions to ask and you wouldn't have seen tesla be real you know you wouldn't have gotten the essence of how smart he was and you're not getting the essence of how how smart uh, Elon Musk is because this guy doesn't know how to ask the questions that would do that. So that that got on my last nerve because he's got an opportunity not only for to show everybody in the world, you know, look at this guy. You let's see what he let's see what he's like. He didn't get to do it for himself. He didn't care enough for himself to go. Geez, this guy's like one of the smartest dudes in the whole wide world. You know, it's the richest cat on the planet. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, this is going to be great. I bet he didn't lay up at night that night before that going, I'm going to ask this. I'm going to find out what he thinks about that. I'm just going to go in and talk about Twitter. The, uh, granted, it was about Twitter, but I mean, he didn't get, he didn't sidetrack anywhere and get anything good in there. We didn't get to see him think. Yeah. So that, that bothers me. That really bothered me. All right, fellas. Anyway. Thanks. It's another good one. And we'll see you next time.